we always have to have some sort of motivation mm -hmm. that drives us forward, right? Yeah. And in the early days, usually it's to run away from something. Mm -hmm. That we want to run away from our a job that we have, uh, an income ceiling that we have that we want to get away from. Uh, people telling us we can't do it. Or in my case, it was I didn't want to go to a job. That's what I was running away from. I saw my buddies over here. They were getting good paying engineering jobs, mm -hmm. like 60, 70, 80 grand a year out of the gates. I said, I don't want that. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we've got Trevor Mock with Carrot.com and Trevor flew in from Eugene, Oregon. Talk about the best way to find motivated seller leads online in 2023. Now, as you guys know, I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on the show alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. And the show is brought to you by our sister company, InvestorLift. Get access to millions of cash buyers across the country. Go to InvestorLift.com, put in Disruptors to get 10% off. And if you get value out of today's show, please hit that subscribe button. That way we can all grow together. You ready? Ready. Let's do it. All right. So first question is, what was your life like right before you got into real estate? Dude, so right before we hit record here, we were, we were kind of talking briefly about it. And I got into real estate young, mm -hmm. um, 21 years old. I was going to college. A few and, years ago, just like five, yeah, six years ago. A, a, couple, a couple years ago. <laughs> yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah. And I ended up buying uh, an apartment building, a four-unit apartment building mm -hmm. there by the college, no money down. So honestly, right before that, it was me going to college, playing baseball, and flunking the LSAT two times. So I, uh, Steve, I, I wanted to be an attorney mm -hmm. um, before I got into real estate because I had this uh, this this business law professor. He was he was Ari Dugroot was the most captivating, engaging professor mm -hmm. at the whole school with the most boring topic in the school, probably business mm -hmm. law. And, I, and he would teach business law through his real estate deals. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if that guy's that excited about his work, I just want to do exactly what he's doing. Yeah. So I got 50% of it. I got the real estate part, and I flunked the LSAT, so I couldn't <laughs> make it in any law schools. Uh, so you played baseball in college. Yep. So you were yep. pretty athletic then. Yeah, I've, I've, I've always loved sports and stuff. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, he played for the A's and the Mariners back in the day. Oh, I didn't know that. In, in the 70s. And then Gene Mock, uh, he was the manager of the Angels for – for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, he's my dad's great uncle. So in our God. family, it's an athletic family, but I wasn't blessed with the height that my dad or my brothers mm -hmm. have. They're all six foot tall and I'm, I'm not. Yeah. And um, so I had to work a little bit harder. Sure. Yeah. Where'd you go to college? A, a little, little tiny college called Oregon Institute of Technology. It's, it's the it. MIT of Oregon. M <laughs> the MIT of Oregon, man. It's <laughs> OIT. Uh, it was in, in the hometown I grew up in, Klamath gotcha. Falls. And that's right where that four unit apartment building was. So you was. bought a fourplex near there. Mm -hmm. What compelled yep. you to buy a fourplex? Yeah, being honest, I, I remember way way back to when, when I was a kid. Um, my mom and dad weren't entrepreneurs at the start, and they became entrepreneurs by necessity. Um, my dad lost one of his jobs; he lost his job, and so my mom, out of necessity, started a business in in the basement. And mm -hmm. so I remember walking in the basement in this house, and she had shelves up, and she was like doing wedding consultations for brides. And so then my dad. He got another job and then he got in, in, in that business went out of business and he goes, I'm going to, I'm just going to start my own company now. Yeah. So he did where, where turning to real estate was my dad started buying some real estate as it was related, uh, was, was related to that company, mm -hmm. the, the real estate that the business was on. Then he bought the houses behind it to expand that business. It's, a, it's like a United rentals type of a company, equipment yeah. rental. And him and I would have conversations. I remember young about, Hey, did you know, Trevor, you can, buy a house, a foreclosed house for $200. I'm like, dad, I got $200 in the bank. And I'm like 10 years old, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of planted the seed probably. Yeah. It was just my dad speaking into me the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then in college, we were sitting there, um, we were watching TV one day and Carlton Sheets infomercial comes up. And I'm like, man, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna get in real estate and buy those properties like we used to talk about when I was a kid, dad, like a younger kid. And he goes, well, I'll work a deal with you. I'll buy that course for you. I'll pay the 500 bucks to get the no money down home study course. And you don't have to pay me back mm -hmm. as long as you buy a property using it within 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't have 500 bucks. I'm, I'm only going to take the deal if I think I can do it. So yeah. I did. And I just hunted for that year. Uh, college kid, no credit, mm -hmm. no money. I didn't have any money. And bought a four unit apartment building, no money down. I still own it today. Cash flowed from day one because I didn't have any money. Yeah. So that's how it started. So you did the Carlton Sheets thing. You're 100%. Like, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's cool. So like. A lot of people bought, bought the Carlton Sheets yeah. product. Very few were able to actually do something with it and 
turn it into something. Right? It was the most basic stuff. I mean, I remember the contracts. I was going through the contracts, and and I still have the course today in my office. And I was looking through it a couple of years ago. I'm like, this is the most basic stuff. But I think for me, Steve, um, and I think probably for a lot of people listening to this, if if we have the fire, if we have the the desire to go mm-hmm. change the circumstance, we will find the how. Yeah. Right. The Carlton Sheets gave me a little bit more belief mm-hmm. that I could do it in a couple tools. But then I honestly just started seeking out resources online. It was yeah. like before Bigger Pockets, it was mm-hmm. Cree Online, C R E Online dot com. Oh yeah. Uh, that that was my jam. I was on Cree Online in the in the school <laughs> library. Yeah. And uh finally I I got over the nervousness of getting that first deal and I and I I landed a deal. Yeah, I mean and there's so it sounds like for Carlson Sheets for you it was like a lot for a lot of us, right? It was Rich Dad Poor Dad. Mm-hmm. It's not so much the technical know how. It's just to open yep. our eyes about the possibility. Yeah. Dude, I've never read Rich Dad Poor Dad, believe yeah. it or not. So yeah. people that come on my podcast, the, the biggest book they're like, is like Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's what right. started it off. Mm-hmm. And I almost feel like I don't need to read it now because I think I've I mean, absorbed I think you're so much of it. I think you probably figured out that. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the magic of the freedom number and like cash yeah. flow and yeah, you can yep. quit your, or you can quit your job. I think you figured that out. Yeah. yeah I, I figured <laughs> some probably that took the long route a little bit, but yeah, right. that was the, the, the start. Yeah, but the other thing too, you know, talking about opening your eyes, like it's so cool that at 10 years old, you were thinking, talking about real estate with your dad. Mm. You know, like my 12 year old, we were in the car the other day and she was, we we're talking about, you know, at some point she's going to have all these, she's going to have this investment income. Yeah. Like, she called it investment income. I was like, okay, and that's, you sound so smart. What kind of investment income are you talking about? Mm. I was like, well, I'm going to have real estate. It's like, mm. man, like just exposing them to that information yeah. at such a young age, who knows the possibilities. And the other thing too is, you know, you look at Carl's and she's, I don't, called the infomercials mm-hmm. where they like kind of like one of those like in your face super flashy well i i remember carlton talking then i would like show some guys at a swimming pool mm-hmm. getting interviewed about how they you know have twenty thousand a month but yeah it was definitely putting the lifestyle in front of you yeah. and stuff like that yeah. another reason why i bring that up is like you know that inspired you mm-hmm. right so there are so many people that say comparisons is thief of joy and i mm-hmm. get where they're coming from yep but for me like and you're talking about the fire mm-hmm. If I see what's possible, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I just need yeah. to know that it's possible. Mm-hmm. I'll figure out the how. You show me what can be done, yeah. I will get it done. Yep. Right. And that sounds like the same thing here, right? It wasn't like he told you this magic thing that no one else knows mm-hmm. about. He, he 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 gave me the spark. And um, dude, one thing I've been I've been doing a lot the last five, six, seven years, especially the last five. It is pulling back, and I, I draw a lot on my iPad. Like I draw yeah. circles and shapes and models, and that's like. 50% of my work these days is taking concepts and going, how do I simplify this down to something that makes sense for me, but also that makes sense for others. And one, one that I did years ago, I was just drawing down, why is it that I keep going through these patterns of mm-hmm. I'm pumped about business, I'm fired up about it. And then three years later, I'm like, oh my gosh, I went out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to shift the business or adjust this or whatever. Tear it all apart. Yeah. And yeah. so probably five, six years ago, I drew this thing and I, I today call it the three year turn and burn cycle. Mm-hmm. And what I'd recognize about myself and I found is true with pretty much every other entrepreneur that I've, that I've met so far is in the early days, like we always have to have some sort of motivation mm-hmm. that drives us forward, right? A, a vision. A carrot, no pun intended. Yeah, there we go. A carrot. Ex- exactly. Yeah. And in the early days, usually it's to run away from something, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's that we want to run away from our, a job that we have. Uh, an income ceiling that we have that we want to get away from. Uh, people telling us we can't do it. Or in my case, it was I didn't want to go get a job. That's what I was running away from. I saw my buddies over here. They were getting good paying engineering jobs, mm-hmm. like 60, 70, 80 grand a year out of the gates. And I was going and not getting a job the first year. And I dragged down the average starting salary at our school pretty heavily because I made $16,000 the next year. But I was pumped about it because I said, I don't want that. I've seen enough people go into the traditional world, family members, friends, and they they took the more guarantee high pay up front, and they're in the same spot 30 years later. So I was running away from that. And the challenge a lot of us have then is once you get that initial success out of the way and you build a business that starts to get some sort of consistency and you buy back some of that time, then around that three-year mark, I call it the three-year turn and burn uh, cycle, two to four years, people start to have this series of things happen. They start to get bored of the business. It's not new anymore. It's not mm-hmm. fresh. The startup is kind of behind them. Um, they start to get burnt out potentially because now they're not really sure what is the fire that drives me forward to this thing again. Uh, they start to get distracted 
okay, I'm going to become a coach now. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Then they start a new business instead of now going, no, this is the opportunity rather than running away from something where my vision and motivation is moving away and I need to move towards something. Mm -hmm. I need to move towards something I believe in. So that, that, that Carlton Sheets was the initial spark. He got me moving away from getting a job. But then over the years, I've had so many times where I had to reignite or what I call refuel that vision, refuel the vision to keep the spark going. Gotcha. Yeah. So you buy the fourplex. Yep. Don't have to pay your dad back. No, didn't have to pay him back. He did though. I'll, I'll, I'll fully admit to this. I didn't have 10,000 bucks and the seller was asking for 10 grand as uh, a down payment. Gotcha. And so I go back to my dad. I didn't know what private money was, right? right. I just knew I didn't have 10 grand and to make the <laughs> deal happen. I said, Hey dad, I learned about this on this website on Cree online. Um, that I can get people who have money and they can loan me money. And would you just loan me that 10 grand that I don't have uh, for that same interest rate? The seller's carrying the note. The seller carried a 30 year note at 6%. Um, I still have that note today. Uh, we negotiated it down to four and a half percent years ago, but so he put the 10 grand in. I paid him back way early, but yeah, I got the property. I was mowing lawns. I was fixing stuff. I'm yeah. a college kid. Mm -hmm. Just getting it done. So it was a learning College process. Fourplex, that's not a common. No. <laughs> no, my, my buddies on the baseball team, um, I would always roping them into, into entrepreneur stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started a landscaping business. And I'm like, I like designing stuff. At that time, Steve, I didn't know I liked drawing. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I've recognized over the years that I like taking something and sketching it out. And so in that time, I would go to a person that had a crappy yard. Mm -hmm. I would go draw something in front of their house. I'd walk up the door, knock on the door, and start talking with them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I kind of think something like this would be kind of cool. And most of them threw me out of there, but I, I got three people to say yes. Yeah. And so I hit my buddies up. I'm like, guys, I got a landscaping job this weekend. We're going to get it all done. We're going to get like five days worth of work done in a weekend because we don't have time. We have baseball practice. Mm -hmm. And we, we did three of those jobs that way. <laughs> and so between that and the fourplex, I think they were kind of used to me bringing them in on, <laughs> on right. some crazy business ideas. Gotcha. So – after that fourplex, how much more real estate did you buy while you were in college? Yep, uh, that was the only one in college. And one thing I wish I would have done, Steve, as I look back, and if there were, I wouldn't say regrets, I'd say data points and things I learned that, that I'd like to pass along to others and I have since changed, is I got that property and I go, what if I would have got one property a year, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's almost 20 years since then. What if I would have got one fourplex a year for 20 years? That's 80-something units. That fourplex is almost paid off now. Um, it'd be way different. Instead, I go, oh, I did that. Now let me move to the next thing. Yeah. So well, that's that's the challenge for us yeah. visionaries, entrepreneurs is like, it's exciting. Let's do mm -hmm. it once. Yep. Yep, exactly. It. So I, I, I didn't do any more in college. And then we moved from Klamath Falls where mm -hmm. the college is and went to Portland, uh, the big city. Mm -hmm. And my wife was getting her master's degree there. And that's when I gave myself a year. I'm like, I'm going to keep on picking up rental properties over time. But I, I, wanna, I thought I wanted to do wholesaling at that time. And that's 20 where, years ago. Yep. And that's where the internet, where online marketing for me started to come in mm -hmm. is, is right in that moment. It would have been 2007. Mm -hmm. um, I go, I'm going to start figuring out how to do this thing. And I set up websites and Craigslist and the whole thing. That's funny. Yeah. So um, Craigslist is where you started? Mm hmm Yep. So uh, talk, talk about how you were buying properties on Craigslist in 07. Yep. Yeah, so I didn't buy any. That, okay. that, that, that was one of the things where I dove in and wanted to do it, mm -hmm. and I didn't stick with it. Honestly, I didn't stick with it. And for me, I discovered for me that I didn't want to do real estate as a active income. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I like this marketing thing. What yeah. if I do marketing or something like that as the active income and I take my money from marketing put it into real estate long term? Mm -hmm. I got this property over here. It's kind of working out. I can see the numbers stacking up. And mm -hmm. Uh, even back then, I coined the term evergreen income. I'm like, mm -hmm. I just want this evergreen income, stuff that just keeps coming in instead of hamster wheel income. So I didn't pick any up, but I, I learned a lot about yeah. marketing. Uh, I made a little website from a GoDaddy website builder. Um, it was brutal, man. It was like, you could still pull it up to today, I'm sure, uh, on Wayback Machine. But it got my start, and I got mm -hmm. leads. And I was just going to Craigslist writing up little ads and posting to go over there. And I talked to sellers and met with some. Mm -hmm. I've made some offers, but yeah. um, I shifted my focus about mid-year to, to learning marketing. So you went to, to buy real estate, yep. and then instead you became a marketer. Yep. <laughs> hey, look, I went through, yeah. 
I, I am the yeah. last one to judge, right? Yeah. I, mean, I went through this marketing world as well. I yeah. I was just at ClickFunnels uh, a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, and someone pulled me aside. I was like, Steve, where did you learn all this marketing stuff? Yeah. Because it's readily apparent, right? Like yeah, you're, you're doing a marketer. You're doing all the stuff, the marketing stuff. And yeah. I was thinking, like, where did I learn? Because it's been so long, mm. right? From yeah. when I went to a realtor to getting my own leads and this and that. It's like, oh yeah, there was like a year and a half where I was obsessed with Dan Kennedy. Yeah. I completely forgot about that season. Dude, Dan Kennedy, if, if, if anyone's wanting to be great, a great marketer, well, well number one, be a great salesperson. Mm-hmm. You, I think you need to be great at marketing too. Mm-hmm. Right. You don't have they go to. go hand in hand. Yeah, they, they do. Uh, you, you don't have to. Like, you can be a great salesperson know nothing about marketing, mm-hmm. but if you're going to own the business, you should, you should be proficient in both. Yeah. And Dan Kennedy, so kind of talking through that journey, and if I were to plant some seeds for y'all. If you become a great marketer, if you become a decent marketer and a decent salesperson, you're yeah. going to have more income potential. You'll never than, be hungry. Yeah, than 98% of everyone out there. Yeah. If you become a great marketer and a decent salesperson, even better. If you become a killer salesperson, mm-hmm. okay marketer, you're going to be good. If you become killer at both, you're an eight-figure entrepreneur. Yeah. And so at, in, in, in that stage, I started to have a hunger for marketing, but it was from it wasn't from the perspective of, I need to go sell stuff. Honestly, where I got bit by the marketing bug, Steve, was um, two things. So I was doing, I was cold calling Craigslist leads mm-hmm. just to make some money on the side for a mortgage broker. I wasn't making any money in real estate. So I, I tried to be a marketing consultant and it turned into me cold calling Craigslist leads, this guy. <laughs> and um, Prospecting is a form of marketing. Yeah. That's the most effective. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I yeah. discovered I didn't like it. Yeah. And he walks in one day and, and he goes, he goes like, pull up, pull up the computer and type up you know, Portland, Oregon mortgage brokers. Mm-hmm. And I did. And, and, um, he goes, how do I get there? You know, at the top of Google, and I go, I don't, I don't know. And he goes, can you figure it out? I go, yeah, let, let me give it a try. That was 2007. And that sparked my desire to go, let me see how Google works. Mm-hmm. Let me, you know, once I figure that out and I got traffic, then it goes, I got people coming to the website, but it's not converting. Right. So let me now figure out how conversion works. At mm-hmm. that moment, that's when I found Dan Kennedy mm-hmm. and all the, yeah, the, the marketers. Yeah, all the direct response marketing. Oh, so, man. Guys, uh, if you guys want to get better at marketing, I highly recommend you check out Dan Kennedy. Mm. I also recommend that you keep your wallet as far away from you as possible because <laughs> uh, the guy, is yeah. his copy is so good that he can sell you something he doesn't even sell anymore Yeah, from his copy. Yep. Oh, exactly. Dude. Yeah. I, I remember getting for years his Dan Kennedy No BS newsletter. Oh, see, I, I remember the GK, JKIC. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and then yeah, when he had his newsletter and then GKIC, they merged, and then mm-hmm. his new- newsletter became like the cool. Mm-hmm. I thought it was the cool part of the rest of the newsletter. Oh, I loved right because like mm-hmm. back in, I mean, this for me, I think it's like like maybe 2010, 2011. Yeah. Like, I loved getting mail from GKIC because yep. it was never just uh, a, a newsletter. I mm-hmm. mean, there was some widget or something in there. It was lumpy mail. Yep, right. It was yep. just something that like made you like want to open it and mm-hmm. figure out what's in there. Yeah. Yeah, and what, one of the cool things, kind of, uh, hopefully, I'll drop some nuggets for y'all to kind of pull away from this in, in my in my journey, um, and to kind of set context for everyone too, because people might be going like, "What the heck does this guy know?" O- over the years, I've had a chance to build a few businesses. Carrot, uh, we're well into the eight figures. We have about sixty five employees there, um, and then a part owner in several other companies. Mm-hmm. SalesMessage dot com is an eight figure company now. Mm-hmm. Helped found that company, and so throughout that journey. You know, we've been executing these things. But one of the cool things I learned from Kennedy that probably started to change things for me and started to actually make me money at that time was number one, he told stories a lot, mm-hmm. right? So in, in his marketing, oftentimes it's story. Yeah, It's not just, hey, I've got this thing and go, you know, go click this thing and go buy it. Mm-hmm. It was usually a story that was compelling. It wrapped you in or he would use language that would just be different than mm-hmm. in other marketing and it would pull me in. And so I started to use story more. Mm-hmm. And the next thing that I also started to do is I started to give more things away mm-hmm. for free. Uh, it, if you guys are, are salespeople and you're looking to, to grow something, oftentimes our first inclination is I'm going to go sell this thing. And mm-hmm. when I didn't have much of a product on the other end or confident, confidence in it, I wasn't selling it well. And even if you're not a good salesperson, it's hard to sell something. Mm-hmm. And so in those early days when I wasn't, I was trying to sell something, get no, no, no over and over again. And Dan was giving all this free stuff away. And I go, what if I just gave the thing away for free? What mm-hmm. if I just like literally went to people on Google and the same ones I was trying to pitch some SEO stuff to, I just emailed and did a little video and sent it to him and said, hey, I, I looked at your site and they're all up in Portland, Oregon. I looked at your site. 
There's a few things that are really killing your search rankings. If you just do these things, it'll fix it. Literally put these things on your site here. Just send this to your web person mm -hmm. and you know, good luck and hope things are great. Right. And most of the people- You were doing SEO audits. Yeah, and just giving it to them. Yeah, that's awesome. And just saying, give it to your web person. I always said that, give it to your web guy because then it made it sound like I wasn't selling them anything. And uh, a lot of them would say, thank you, that's amazing. But then some of them would say, thank you, that's amazing. I don't have a web person. Can you do this for me? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the first couple, I even did it for free. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, just give me the login. I did it. I pulled away. And then that person, the first one I did it for free, said, can you do more of this stuff for me? Maybe I want to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. Right. So it's like doing sales, but actually novel idea, actually adding value first. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Before, before you go in for the sale, that was a biggie for me. Yeah. And then, you know, just to modernize it, right, just for 2023, if mm -hmm. you look at like, I don't know if there's a better storyteller than Pace Morby. Yeah. Pace is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you guys are looking like, you know, we're talking about the context of telling mm -hmm. stories, it's just. Dude. So see what he's talking about. Yeah. A, 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 on any platform. Yep. Pace is amazing. And, and he's a giver. So that yeah. goes back to that same. Right. That he's same giving context. value at no, at no charge. Yeah. And one, one of the best things I've found, we're going through this with Carrot right now too. Mm -hmm. Is is anytime you can give away what people are, are charging for, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you stand out. So right. if you're if you're marketing a product or selling a product, pull back and ask number one: Is it a commodity mm -hmm. or is it close to that? Um, and if if it is like real estate information, I wouldn't say it's a commodity, but you know, it's there's a lot of it out there you can get for free. It's, it's hard to justify a premium. Yeah, um, when you look at the basic SEO audit, there's a lot of things you can do do out there for it, but. People were charging for it at that time. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, let me just give it away for free. Right. And I'll figure out something else to sell. Mm -hmm. And so think about that, y'all. What are people selling? Can you give it away for free? And then can you offer a service or something on the back end of that mm -hmm. that is actually even more valuable that they're going to need? Right. So you want to go figure out how to rank the SEO. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to rank for this mortgage broker. Yep. And after figuring out how to rank, you figure out how to get people to opt in. As we say, conversion, you take. They're on the yeah. page. How do we collect their information? Yeah. Yeah. So people were, people were coming to the site and I had Google analytics up and all that stuff. And I had a couple sites at that time. So we had the, we had the mortgage one. I had my own, which is called reibrain.com. It's still up there. It was like where I was typing up all the things I was learning, Yeah. which I ended up hitting the end of my knowledge pretty quickly because I was just, I had some rental properties. Mm -hmm. And so I was putting like property management reviews and I was putting my documents up and just teaching some basic things, talking about market and stuff. So I would get people to the site and looking at the stats, I'm going, man, people, how do I get someone to take the next step? And I dove into things like Dan Kennedy's stuff mm -hmm. or Ryan Dice's stuff and just really learning conversion rate optimization at that yeah. point. And that's a fancy term for how do you, re how do you remove the resistance mm -hmm. um, from someone, in this case, a web visitor, so they are clear and they feel confident in taking a next step with you to solve yeah. a problem they have. Well, and the question you got to answer when they're on the website is, am I at the right place? Yep, exactly. And part of that's copy. Part of it's the structure of the form, mm -hmm. the page. And over the next, I guess, really decade, uh, see, even that's what led into Carrot after a couple of business failures, a mm -hmm. couple that did okay. Um, I, I carried those skill sets with me in every business. How do you create content that ranks well in Google, that's compelling, that builds trust? And how do you, once people are there, convert them into a lead? And then mm -hmm. how do you take that lead and do something with it? Right. Yeah. So how long did, it, like, how much time did it take from the, the point of like, hey, Trevor, can you figure out mm -hmm. whether you can rank this to like, hey, I have something that I can sell? Um, probably, I mean, it was probably a year and a half, two years yeah. maybe. Uh, I, I, I probably knew a little bit more than I was giving myself credit for at the mm -hmm. time, but I didn't know how to sell it or didn't have enough track record. But where, where things really changed for me with my own businesses at that time, so this is kind of dating it for people 2008, and I'm going to keep on dropping as many sales or marketing tips as people can pull out because these, these are the dots, right? Like mm -hmm. as Steve Jobs says, it's very hard to connect the dots moving forward, mm -hmm. but you can connect them backwards. Right. So if anyone's behind where I am right now as an eight-figure entrepreneur, then it's hard for you to connect those dots forward. So hopefully you can use my dots mm -hmm. to make that for you. So. Um, I was learning that skill set. You have to master one skill set, at least. Like, master a skill set. Put your head down and say, I'm going to become amazing at sales, mm -hmm. like Steve. Or I'm going to become amazing at this form of online marketing. And I got good at it. And so a guy named Patrick Riddle, who you've probably seen speak. Yeah, Patrick Riddle is genius. Yeah, we're in family mastermind together. Yeah, amazing. So, so Patrick and I used to be business partners. Okay. And a lot of people don't know my background in this industry, but I'll keep on connecting it all the way to 
on how each thing built mm -hmm. to build what we have today. So Patrick was making comments on my blog and I'm like, I ran out of stuff to write content on. So um, this guy seems like he knows a lot and he keeps on making comments. So I hit him up. We hop on a call. Uh, he'd done a bunch of flips and raised a bunch of private money. And he was just ready for a change. He hit the three-year turn and burn cycle. Mm -hmm. He was three years in and he didn't know how to grow through that pain line. He didn't know how to grow through that pain line of once I hit a million dollars a year, who do I need to hire? How do I need to grow? Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he got distracted. Mm -hmm. He 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 self-sabotage. Yeah, self-sabotage, as Dan Martell says in his, in his book. And he found my block. Mm -hmm. And so I'm grateful that he did. So we hop on a call. He's great at private money. I said, hey, it's perfect time. No one can get bank loans for properties in 2008. Let's just do a free call to all these leads I have over here that I have no clue how to monetize mm -hmm. um, and add value to. And I ran out of ways to add value to them. Let's do a free call, dude. We're not selling anything. It's how to teach uh, to teach how to raise private lending. Yep. From money. So we did with no intention on selling anything. We get to the end of this call, and this is kind of in the early days of the internet marketing world and launches and people being used to buying things on webinars. Mm -hmm. I was naive to that. I was just doing content. And you're using that thing again, just give away, give away. Yep. And someday something will come back. Um, and at the end of it, people kept saying, where can I like, where can I buy something? Can we have Patrick coach us? And I'm like, oh, man, no. We're just, let's schedule another webinar. Let's just do another one and give all, you know, guys, just come on again and ask all your questions. It'll mm -hmm. be free. And so between that, we did talk. And we said, I don't know, maybe, are, are, we, are, we, are we not serving people well if we don't actually package together your knowledge, Patrick, and give them something they can truly use mm -hmm. uh, more effectively versus just a bunch of rando free stuff? And so we prepared it on that second call. A bunch of people still ask that. We drove them to a wait page. Um, and we ended up you know, having our first product that we ever sold. And that turned into a business that it didn't make millions um, per year. It made, mm -hmm. you know, probably a million to two over the years. Um, but we did, we had a great business together. Right. We were 50, 50 business partners. And that was probably that time period, uh, 2008 through 12. Closer to the 12 is probably where I learned the most about myself as an entrepreneur. And that time period, that 2012, is what then completely changed the way I looked at business mm -hmm. that turned into what we have today. So how did, how did you change your, your outlook on business? Yeah, so in, in the early days, um, I followed a lot of advice. That I think is good, decent advice, well-meaning, but mm -hmm. I kept on hearing people say, man, take a, take a piece of paper, line down the middle of the paper, and write out the things that make you money and the things that don't make you money, right? And all the things that don't make you money that you're using, like cross them off or have someone else do them and delegate them. Mm -hmm. And all the things that make you money, spend more time doing that. Right. So I did. Um, learned copywriting, became pretty good at that. Creating products, became pretty good at that. I ran the business, did all the marketing. Patrick was the educator out mm -hmm. front. Um, the funny thing was about 80% of those things that made us money, marketing campaigns, writing copy, they drain my energy, dude. Mm -hmm. They drain my energy. And so once again, got three years into that business. Okay. And I didn't recognize these patterns at that time. I got three years in. I'm like, I don't like this business anymore. We're making some good money. And I'm grateful for that. We have great customers. We have great products I'm proud of. But if it's going to be like this for 10 more years, I don't know if I want this. Right. Maybe I should go get a job at Nike or something. And I was seriously thinking about that. And so I thought, well, maybe it's the next income level. Maybe, maybe if we had a million a year, mm -hmm. then it will change. Maybe. That'd be more fun. Yeah. And, yeah. and what I've found now is that doesn't change. You have some more resources to do some things with, and you can now hire people to buy back your time, but you're always going to have the next level, the next thing you're chasing. Right. And so what I, uh, I, I, I had met a guy named Greg Clement. You may, you may know, you know, Greg, I'm not familiar. Real flow. Yes. Um, so Greg started that he's not really involved in the day to day, but mm -hmm. now if I look at Greg and I'm like, it seems like from the outside in, Greg's life is kind of like what I want. Mm -hmm. He's coaching his kids' football teams. He's, he's, I think he's probably five, six years older than me, maybe a little bit more. He, he had a business with, you know, this multi-million dollar business. Um, he had employees, like he had a couple dozen, which I'm thinking, dude, I never want 20 employees. Right. We have 60 plus in one company today. But I evolved and I grew. And so the first ever mastermind I joined was that year in 2012. The only year Greg had it, he did it that one year, closed it down. And it's almost like, like it was built for me that mm -hmm. year, you know. And I was trying to figure out how he was able to have multiple businesses that looked all really interesting and exciting, 
And he literally spent like a day or two in this business a week. And he would only do the things that he was good at. And he would fly out. And I'm going, that sounds like a dream. Perfect. Yeah. So I joined his <laughs> mastermind to get closer to him to figure this thing out. Right. Yeah. And he told me this one thing. And he said, he said he learned it from strategic coach from Dan Sullivan's uh, program. A great program. I've gone through that. Yeah. I, I did it for a year after that. I should have yeah. done it longer. And it was like the third session. Uh, I even bought the book. Um, on unique ability. I read the book, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And unique ability, it didn't hit me. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me. I thought it did. But I kept going back to that list of the things that made me money. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm like, well, I'm good at these things. People tell me I'm good at them. I get paid well to do them. Those must be the things I should do more of. And this gal, so I was wrestling through that. She was our coach. And she said, Trevor, the way that I have found unique ability, the way I've found my unique ability is is." You have more energy when you're done doing those things mm-hmm. than when you started. Yep. And she goes, write down that list. What's the list of things that give you more energy than when you're done than when you started? Mm-hmm. I go, okay, that's a little different. I had a tough time with it though, Steve, because I was trying to justify a lot of the things on, on the list didn't make any money. Mm-hmm. They didn't make any money or I had no clue how to make money. Yeah. I'm going, but if I do all that, all these things over here that make money, who's going to do those? And does that mean I just need to be broke and happy because Mm -hmm. if these things make me money i don't want to do them anymore and these things don't i don't know so right after that i I went home and i created a process i i still use today i coach it to our customers and team members called the energy audit Mm -hmm. so in 2012 i made the energy audit and it's same thing lying down the middle of paper but i switched the words i said energy give energy drain and then i write down all the things that drain my energy in an average work week in life business everything right everything and i'm writing all these things writing copy did it like literally executing anything like anything okay and then all the things over here that are like meetings and all this stuff and i'm going i don't know how i'm going to be in business if i don't do those <laughs> things anymore and then over on the right side i go uh, i like strategy mm-hmm. i want to blow up the whiteboard and leave mm-hmm. how's that happen but but you just dream like that gives me energy working out gives me energy this kind of stuff gives me energy mm-hmm. you're talking with entrepreneurs and that stuff gives me energy and I go, well, I don't know how to make it happen now. And I know I want what Greg wants or what Greg has, but I think I'm a little ways away from it. What if every quarter I go down here, I do this audit, and I, at the bottom I, I measure it, like just gut level, what percentage of my average work week is energy draining and energy giving? Mm-hmm. And I did that gut level thing at that time, put it at the bottom. 80% of my work week was energy draining. Yeah. I go, oh, my gosh, no wonder I'm not enjoying my business. Why I was trying to sabotage it. And I go, what if I do this every quarter and I circle one or two of the things in the energy drain column, write down how many hours I'm spending on each one of those. And before any project at work, that's what I do. I create a process. I either say no to that or I create a process for it and I delegate it. Mm-hmm. And I go to the energy gives column. I say, now I've got 10 hours a week that these things are getting done. Uh, what am I going to fill that with? Mm-hmm. Even if it doesn't make me money, especially if it doesn't make me money. Mm-hmm. Cause if I can show up with more energy at work, yeah. um, I'm probably going to be better and we might even be able to make more money. Right. So I, I did that. And that actually led me to discovering that that business with Patrick, I love Patrick. We're still, we run a mastermind together still, but that business wasn't going to get me where I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. Funny thing is Steve years later. So Patrick, their company does 25 plus million a year here. It's an eight figure company. We completely switched roles. Here it's the guy be- or uh, Patrick's the guy behind the scenes doing the marketing, mm-hmm. running the business. He hates being out front. Mm. I'm the guy out front. I like educating, training, <laughs> and I don't like any of the execution stuff. Yeah. And I've got a team that does it. So go after optimize for energy rather than productivity or revenue. Yeah. That was the big change for me. Well, I like what you say, right? Because they, they, they do tell you, write down this list, like what's mm-hmm. income producing, what's not income producing. Yep. Right. And at a high level, that's still, there's truth to that. There is. Yeah. Um, but then one thing we talk about inside the whale club is we mm-hmm. talk about there's multiple currencies. Yep. So there's the money currency, which is what that list is. Yep. But there's also the energy currency, mm-hmm. right? Like, Huge. hey, which one gives you energy, which one doesn't? Mm-hmm. And we talk about which one gives you more influence, which one doesn't. There we go. Which one gives like you more that. attention, which one doesn't, right? So mm-hmm. we talk about the, the, the multiple currencies. But the other thing, too, is I went through the same exact exercise as a strategic coach. Yeah. And we went through unique ability. And you know what my unique ability is? Probably this stuff, right? This stuff, for sure, <laughs> which I didn't know yet. Yeah. Teaching. Gotcha. Yeah, right? that makes sense. But then yeah. I look around. It's like, well, because I did say at mm-hmm. some point when I was growing up. Yep. When I have enough money, I want to be a school teacher because I actually go. love teaching. There we right? go. And then, well, that's never obviously come to pass. But yeah. then when I have my brokerage, what I enjoy the most 
not showing houses, mm-hmm. not talking to homeowners. It was teaching mm. all the realtors in my organization how to run a business, right? There we go. And I yep. got massive fulfillment from that. However, that's also not profitable because mm-hmm. realtors don't like to pay splits. Yep. Yep. Right? <laughs> and so my friend, my best friend, my accountability partner to this day was telling me to shut it down mm. because you don't make money from it. He's like, it's fulfilling. He's like, I don't care what's fulfilling. Find someone that's <laughs> yeah. something else fulfilling yep. that gives you energy that you can make money from. I was like, I don't exactly. know what it is. And so I think that a couple of different things, you know, and this is going to sound, you know, entirely boastful, mm-hmm. right? But like, there's a lot of people that get into coaching for the money. Yeah. And that works. But how can you deliver the same level if you're doing it for money? Like, yeah. I'm doing it because I love it. I yeah. love watching people win. Yeah. Right? I, I can tell. You, you can tell that, man. And, yeah. and I think that's also why you guys are making the, the, the pivot, to, not pivot, but the adjustment to broaden your audience, right? Because yeah. you're going, I love it. Yeah. How can I get in front of more people and help more people do the same thing? It's you wouldn't exciting. do that if you didn't love it. Right. It's exciting. Yeah. And then the yeah. podcast part, like this right here, mm-hmm. this is what I was doing before I had a podcast. Yeah. Right. We just turned the cameras on. Yeah. But like before, I was like, hey, Trevor, can, you want to go grab some lunch? Mm-hmm. Let's talk business. Yeah, exactly. All we're doing here. Dude, that, and and that, that's so key. And, and that's something I, I want every single person listening to. So I don't care what, I don't care if you're doing 10 million a year or $10 a year. It's like, I know so. We both probably know so many people who have a lot of money and they have great businesses, and they are absolutely hating their business. And we all go through that ourselves. We go through those seasons. We do, right? So it's not like I'm sitting here walking on clouds <laughs> and every day is a, a ten out of ten. Um, yeah, we've got hard times, and, mm-hmm. and that's where those cycles, like I talk about, the three year turn and burn cycle. It's three years. It's not just three years from the time you start your company. Mm-hmm. It's every three years. Yeah, it's like every two to four years. And you have to refresh that vision or refuel that vision mm-hmm. because now what was exciting you and driving you forward three years ago, you ran out of runway in that vision. Yeah. And now we need to go, cool, what's that next bit of fuel that's going to drive me forward? So as, as long as you know the things that give you energy mm-hmm. and those unique abilities, you get to carry those with you. And those things actually are what elevate that vision I've found the next time around because you yeah. go, oh my gosh, I love teaching. I love this. I love this. Okay, now how can I expand that vision this next time around to to expand my impact there? Ideally, every time you go up in those threes and tens, because businesses break at threes and tens, Mm -hmm. every time you go up in those threes and tens, ideally, it should be to refine and put you more into your energy work every single time you do it. Mm -hmm. Then you figure out what are the right next hires to replace myself and the things I'm good at that Mm -hmm. make money but drain my energy. And that, that's the key. Replace yourself in the things that you're good at, make you money, but drain your energy. Mm-hmm. And spend more time in the things that you're good at, uh, make you money, but give you energy. Exactly. It's hard, though. It is hard. And, you know, you talk about the vision. Uh, so last week, mm-hmm. I bought uh, closemoresales.com. Oh, right? that's a good domain, man. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, uh, we had a, uh, a meeting in our organization. We're like, we need a unifying message, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Steve, what are you? What do you do? What do you offer? Yeah. You know, we teach people how to... Close more deals, right? Like yeah. that's been our, that's what we say. But then it's like, you know, we have this product sells leadership. We have, uh, you know, how to buy houses deeper. Mm-hmm. We have like this mentorship course. We do this, do that. We have a podcast, this and that. Like you're confusing the audience. Like, okay, so yeah. what's our unifying message? Which we got, uh, Matthew Pollard wrote a book, uh, mm-hmm. The Introvert's Edge, which is a great book. He talks about the value of a, of a unifying message. Yeah. So like, you know, our message was, you know, we solve sales problems, which still sounds pretty good. Mm-hmm. But I was like, man, like I'm doing the, Going back to our marketing days, yeah, I go to the Google keyword search tool. Mm-hmm. What are people searching for yep. when they're struggling with sales? Yep. And it's, it ultimately comes down to is how do I close more sales? How do mm. I close sales, right? Yep. It's like, all right, so closemoresales.com. That is the unifying message, domain. right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm going to bring this, and I'm bringing this up to you because you made a significant purchase. Yeah. Right? Well, it's yeah. Actually, it's before I get there. Yep. Buying that freed my mind to focus on like, all right, what are we going to do now? Now that we got this, mm-hmm. right? Now we've got a, an excellent address. Yep. Right. This is like 1600 Pennsylvania. Yeah. We got a great address. Yeah. How do we build the best house on this? Right. It's like, you know, what if like perfect world, we get Donald Miller to build our website. Yep. Right. We get Dan Kennedy or Frank Kern to write our copy. Mm-hmm. Right. Like we have yeah. uh, Neil Patel to do all our SEO. Like, yeah. Like this is the perfect world. Yep. So like, this is what I've shared with the team, but like you're talking about refreshing the vision, the three year burn and turn. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you put it this way. Because that explains why I'm losing sleep because I'm mm-hmm. so freaking excited. Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do with this. Yep. So going back to you. Yeah. Carrot.com. That mm-hmm. was not an insignificant investment. 
No, it, it, it was a big one. And at that time, it forced me to refresh the fuel on my vision again because um, kind of fast forwarding through that time period, 2012, energy audit, you know, did that stuff, tried a couple of businesses, two software companies, one completely failed and the other one thought it was going to fail. It pivoted and now it's doing 1.2 million a month right now. Not Carrot. Like it's a, yeah. it's a different company. That's awesome. Um, I don't run it. My buddy, Chris Persson mm. runs that company. He owns the vast majority. I own a little sliver of it, but through, through that process that got me hooked on software. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, I like that business model. How can I now use the skill sets that I've built search engine optimization, conversion rate optimization, real estate knowledge, marry those with this model, with mm -hmm. this new model. And so that's where then carrot came in. And so carrot, you know, we have uh, just shy of 7,000 active real estate investors, mostly flippers, wholesalers. Um, and this feeds into the, the domain purchase. Uh, if you were to Google sell my house fast or cash home buyers or we buy houses in any city in America, Canada, even in South Africa, you're probably going to find like three and eight carrot sites controlling page one in Google and That's all awesome. those markets. Um, we did, we did some math the other day. It's about seven or 800,000 leads a year. Most of those are sellers. Um, one in 15 closing a deal on average. Uh, you know, we're talking close to or around plus or minus a few hundred million, a billion dollars in transaction profits that have came for our customers of the last five years. And so when we were looking at moving away from our old domain, which was on carrot.com. I remember on carrot.com. Dude, it, it was like the blessing and the curse. It got us going. And it made sense to me when we started it because mm -hmm. I'm going, well, I couldn't get carrot.com. We couldn't, I was looking at get carrot.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that was another guy in Oregon had that one. He literally <laughs> registered it the month I was going to register it. Um, so on carrot, like, what are you using? Well, I'm on carrot. There's a thought behind it. But this is an important thing in sales, branding, marketing is recognizing the value of the domain name that a lot of times people will make the domain name synonymous with your company name, mm -hmm. with your company identity. So close more sales um, is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really good. On carrot is confusing. It doesn't, <laughs> that didn't make sense for a company name. So we would have at least half the market calling us on carrot um, on podcasts in. Oh, yeah. This is Trevor Mock with on carrot. Yeah. Uh, Max Maxwell's a big event. I'm speaking in front of a thousand people. <laughs> and I, I tell Max's team, like, it's specifically carrot.com. That's where we first met. That, there we go. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that was right after we had bought carrot.com and moved over to mm -hmm. it, like within months, I think it was. And Max announces me as Trevor with on carrot. I'm like, oh, dude. <laughs> Because it, it, it's hard to brand that, right? And so yeah. at that time, I was going through that, that period of refreshing the vision. Because we started the company officially about 2014, mm -hmm. um, you know, end of 2013. The original vision was a five-year vision, okay? And I kind of looked at it every year and, and updated a little bit. But we were kind of towards the back part of that five-year vision. And we were wrestling with this big investment. And when you're wrestling with the big investment, the vision drives every decision, mm -hmm. right? The vision drives every decision. Yeah. And so we were pulling back and saying, well, what if we don't buy it? Would we be fine in a year, five years, 10 years, if someone else owned the brand of Carrot? Mm -hmm. Not just in real estate, but everywhere. I go, well, if we just stay in real estate, I'd probably be okay with that. If some other company bought it for a ton of money and I'd be okay with that. But then I pull back and refresh the vision. I go, where do we want to go with this thing? Is it just going to be in real estate forever? Can we serve other people in high margin service businesses too? And the answer to that was yes. The founding of the company, the reason it's carrot.com or carrot and not real estate investor websites.com is because we saw the same problem happening in, happening in other high margin service businesses. Real estate's where we start and we expand out from there. Mm -hmm. And we go, yeah, we're going to expand out. How much would we pay in 10 years to buy carrot.com if we tried to own the brand? Like I literally want when people see the color orange mm -hmm. to think of carrot. Yeah. I want when our customers or people in our industry are at a restaurant or they order from Instacart, mm -hmm. they literally take pictures of it and send it to me and say, this made me think of you. Yeah. And that happens all the time. Oh, that absolutely does happen. And so we go, we want to own the word. Mm -hmm. Literally, we want to own every bit of that word. And so making the $600,000 purchase, which that's a whole <laughs> journey of a, of a combo there. Um, we lost it three times. We finally got it through a whole unique process. But... Um, I would make that investment again 10 times over. How do you yeah. talk to me about almost losing it three times? Yeah. So the, I'll, I'll try to give you the cliff notes version. So uh, one guy bought it and he bought the domain in 1996. I think it was, 
He was an artist out of Canada. And he had pioneered this type of art called like ster ster oil or stereo oil or something like that. And um, it, it was interesting. Art was cool. But he used that website to display all of his art. Kara had nothing to do with his art. It was just he bought the domain when the <laughs> internet started. And he's like, dude, I got this cool domain. I'm going to yeah. put my art up there. And so we reached out to Michael over and over again. Just no reply, no reply, no reply. And we're like, man, we're never going to get it. That's like his, that's his spot. That's know? his baby. And so my CTO hits me up. Um, this would have been probably 2017 or so, maybe 2018. He said, Trevor, go to carrot.com. And he didn't say anything else. I go, man. And there's a, a coming soon, like launch page for a software company. Oh. I go, oh, man, I don't know how they got it, but they must have hit him at the right time and they got it. It was a, it was a Reddit, like some sort of a Reddit chat thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it did something. I don't remember what it was. They were venture funded. They literally had carrot in their license plates mm -hmm. and the whole thing. They had, seven figures of funding and i'm going we're never going to get that back. you're all in on it yeah we're we're yeah license plates dude <laughs> we're not gonna be able to buy it from them and so long story short we see them launch and then all of a sudden we see the domain get shut down like 60 days after their launch so they had done something in the reddit community that they were collecting data from the reddit people that they weren't supposed to collect mm -hmm. didn't disclose it and that's what happens to reddit they flame you out of there man like you're gone yeah. yeah, they just got flamed out. So they went out of business before they started. Wow. So I hit up the guy, the, the CEO, and they still had the carrot.com emails working at least. And we were going back and forth. And, and he said, well, um, yeah, we do want to sell it because we have to pay back some of our investors. And he goes, the least we can take for it, though, is 250000 And I'm, in my mind, I'm going, dude, I'll pay up to fifty grand for this thing. And, I, and I, he says that number. I go, I'm thinking, good luck. Like, whoever pays two hundred fifty grand for that's an idiot. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of thought I was playing Mr. Sales guy and doing a pullback sale and whatever. What I learned later was he bought it on terms. The previous owner had got cancer and um, passed away. But before he passed away, he must have got the email at the right time from those guys. He sold it on terms, took a down payment, and then carried a note for $250,000. They went out of business. They stopped paying on it. All of a sudden, they didn't answer my emails. I wasn't going to pay two fifty. dollars Domains down, their emails stopped working. We're like, I don't know, lost it again. So another year later, I get an email from um, my CTO again or uh, Slack. Hey, go to uh, dude. I just found carrot.com on GoDaddy auctions. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you talking about? Go. So I go over there, and there's like seven days left in the auction, and it's already at eighty something grand. And I go, okay, this is gonna go high. So I got to bump up my my number if mm -hmm. I think we're gonna get this. So we did a bunch of math, justified this, that, and the other. Ask that question, what would we pay later for it? Recognize it's an asset. Other mm -hmm. people probably want it. At the very least, I could sell it for some sort of price. So just all these justifications. I go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll offer up to 350 for it now. And so I'm waiting for the last day, waiting for the last day. Two days before the auction ends, it gets taken off of auction. And I'm so, oh, man, dude. So here, here we go again. I get an email from a bogus um, domainer. Name doesn't check out. Phone number goes to a busy signal all the time. And that's how the domain world is. And he says, hey, we took it off because we think we can make more money with the seller off market. Make your best offer. I submitted an offer through escrow.com for 350 grand going, this is my best offer. Don't hear back. I, okay. But two months later, we're like, we lost it. Someone else must have edged us out. And if they, if they paid more for that, you know, good for them. And I'm like, big domain sales, if, if it sold for more than 350, these all get an article. Yeah. Like they get an article. Yeah. So they go to... Domain name journal. Yeah, domain uh, domain sale carrot dot com, mm -hmm. and up pops an article. But it wasn't what I thought. Like it wasn't that it got sold. It was that this big domainer, he's one of the bigger guys in the world. Part of his philanthropy is finding domains that expired and shouldn't have expired because the people lost track of it, or the person's representative mm -hmm. messed it up, or whatever. He found it. He researched heavily in a day and a half to find the owners, the guy who passed away, he mm -hmm. didn't tell his family or his estate that he had sold this domain. They had no clue about it. This domainer finds the family before the auction closes. They do whatever they need to do to get the get ownership to them. And I just reach out to that domainer. I tell our story and cast a vision and and you know just really said I appreciated Michael's art over the years. I did because I looked at it a lot mm -hmm. trying to get that domain. And uh over the, about three months we had a chance to build a connection with the family, build a mm -hmm. connection with that guy. And um, they said they wanted 900 grand. I said, that's more than I'm willing to pay, but we came up with a number that worked for us. Yeah. And 600,000. Were you the sole 
person? Are you the sole owner of Carrot? Yep. Okay, so you didn't have to get it approved by anybody. Just... Well, I, I own 80%. So okay. I, I, I took it back um, to my co-founder, mm -hmm. my technical co-founder, and he was all in on it too. And we, yeah. just, we did the math on it. We had the cash. Uh, we did buy it on terms. Mm -hmm. So kind of use some of the real estate stuff in there. 600K over five years um, with, the, I think it was $125,000 down payment but with the full intention that in two years we were going to renegotiate with them to get an early payoff mm -hmm. for a big discount. And, and we did, I think we got a hundred thousand dollars off by paying it off years early. Explain to me the justification, mm -hmm. not to justify to me, but yeah. for the listeners, because yeah. I'm a giant domainer, right? Yeah. I, I own way too many. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not a giant domainer in that I, I have, I'm a big deal, but that I have a bunch of, yeah, domains. A lot of them. <laughs> yeah. I've got so many, I, I, at one time I went through, cause we have land selling land flipping mm -hmm. websites on carrot where you can get a, a ton of leads that come through Carrot or land mobile home. Mm -hmm. I just went and bought like all the States that I could mm -hmm. find of, you know, um, sell my land, yeah. like all those, I've got a gazillion of them not using, but for, for me, um, one of the things I've always, I've always believed in, I mean, if you guys are watching the video of this, you see my water bottle, you see like, uh, you guys mentioned the orange on my darn uh, suitcase mm -hmm. in there. That carrot t-shirt. Yeah, uh, carrot t-shirt, it's black. I just, you know, changed it up so I'm not an orange all the time. But I, I believe in branding because if, if we can, I, I, Steve, I call it, um, I call it um, subconscious retargeting. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to retarget someone on Facebook, right, someone they visited your website, now you can serve them up an ad to stay in front of them. And early on, I'm going, how do I build a brand that I can get into the, their, their psyche so much and become a part of their world so much that anytime they see the color or the vegetable or the word, they think of us in subliminal or retargeting. And so I'm going, well, I need to own the word then. I want to own the color orange in our industry. That was part of, part of Carrot. When we started the company, I looked at the, the brands, the brands and the colors that are, um, that are in the industry. There weren't any companies in our industry that had orange at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they were blue and whatever. So I'm like, cool, we own orange now. Um, and we can take that word and have create, creative fun things with it. We can make dolls. We, we've sent out thousands of carrot dolls that are super carrot and farmer carrot and all this stuff. So that, that was it. We'd already gone in, all in on this whole carrot thing. And we said, if we are going to expand out of our, our industry, we want to own the word. Because if I'm on a podcast or if, if we're talking at EXPCon like mm -hmm. it was two weeks ago, and I mentioned carrot or carrot software, I want you to be able to Google that and find us. Yeah. Which is hard when it's a vegetable mm -hmm. versus just like, you know. Kleenex. Yeah, Kleenex yeah. or Kajabi or something like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. Well, and, and uh, the other thing too, right? Like um, I had to justify it. My yeah. team. So even though I'm the sole owner of the company, I still have mm -hmm. to justify it, right? Like how, yep. how can you justify spending on like, cause I, I bought in the last, just in the last few years, mm -hmm. right? Like disruptors.com. Right. That's a big one. Yeah. yeah. That was disruptors.com, uh, close mm -hmm. And there's a few other ones, but I mean, even over the years, right? Like I, cause my brokerage was stunning homes realty, right? So I bought stunning yep. right? Like, yeah. It's just, you got some good ones, man. I've been buying them over the years. Yep. And so like, how do you justify it? And mm -hmm. for me, like, again, for everyone listening, um, is like the SEO optimization, right? Yep. The, if someone's looking to buy, if they got a sales organization mm. and they need some sales training and they do a search something about sales and the first, not the first organic result because mm -hmm. SEO is tough as heck. Yeah. But the first pay-per-click result mm. is closemoresales.com slash objections. Yep. That's yep. it. Right? That's they good. can see that. It's like, okay, like mm -hmm. I'm going to get credit from the user. Yeah. There's some, there's some associated credit. But then on top of that, Google. Yep. For SEO reasons or optimization reasons, will charge me less. Mm -hmm. So, like, the, what you pay for it does, you get that money back. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, for example, I just posted on Facebook last week. Say, hey, just bought closemoresales.com, mm -hmm. and the first person I commented sends me a direct message. I need to hire 200 salespeople right now. There we go. Like, Dude, it's a the, unifying message. The, cre the credibility too is huge. So, um, Dan Martel, I think he stopped by here. He stopped by last week. Yeah, uh, yep. last week. So. Um, that's why I'm down here this mm -hmm. week is hanging out with Dan the next two days. And uh, Dan's been my coach since 2017, I think it is. And I ran this by him. I'm like, Dan, it's a big number. I'm getting ready to submit <laughs> this thing. What do you think about it? And he asked me some questions. And uh, to give more tactical justification for it, number one, it's an asset. I mm -hmm. can sell it. it. Software company, dude, we don't have assets. Right. I have a computer that's three years old. And I have a domain name, mm -hmm. really. And we have, we have code and we have customers. Right. right? So... If, if everything, worst case scenario, 
the code were for some reason to be garbage and we didn't have any customers, I would have no assets anymore. Mm -hmm. But I have a domain that's worth something now. Yeah. Right. So that that's one of the, one part of it. I can sell this one word domain. And there's a bunch of other startups that are based that have the carrot name. Uh, mm -hmm. that are well way um heavily venture funded. Uh, the ne the next thing with it was the whole question of am I going to regret this in ten years? Would I what would I pay in five or ten years if I was really wanting to own that? Mm -hmm. Would I regret not paying the extra hundred grand or two hundred grand? I'm like, oh yeah, of course. The one that Dan pointed out to me though, and he, and he would he would introduce me uh, after this. You were in the we're at the the boardroom with the CEO Jeff Jeff Lawson of Twitter of Twitter, mm -hmm. or at the Thumbtack uh, dot com CEO room or the HubSpot's boardroom with their number three guy. Dan, what I was going, and here, here's Trevor Mock, or here's Trevor with Carrot.com. He mm -hmm. never said my domain before I had that. Mm -hmm. And Dan goes, he goes, dude, can you imagine the doors that are going to open when you send an email with Trevor at Carrot.com mm -hmm. versus Trevor at on Carrot? He goes, your status and the the way people are going to treat you seriously in the in the bigger world, mm -hmm. it's going to go way up. You're going to get the email open. You're going to get the reply. Right. And it's happened. So I can get better replies, better opens, people paying attention. Because they look at it and go, they're not a slouch if they were able to get that domain name. This is versus like the realtor that has a Hotmail. Yeah, it, it, exactly. <laughs> hey, send me an email, stevetrang at hotmail.com. Yeah. Dude, so if, if you're a real estate <laughs> investor, as an example, or an agent or whatever, and, and, and you have an email that's, you know, I, I live in Roseburg, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like roseburgrealestate.com or something. Yeah, yeah it's probably going to get a few more doors open than, you know, Marsha, da, 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 whatever it is. Yeah, roseburgrealestate.hotmail.com. Yeah, so the the, the brand is, is is a big deal, and and look at it as an asset. But I do understand that not everyone wants to build a brand, um, and it does take real work to build a brand. An investment. Uh, yeah, it's it's an investment. Here's a couple other things, Steve, that, that we've done over the years that might be interesting for people, may not be, but because we're going, this is our opportunity that if we can, if we can surround our client with our brand and make it so our core values are shared values. And then they, then they, they transfer the values that we have onto the things that we sent them in the mail. Then we're able to now have them relate to our brand on a daily basis, but not because of the color or because of the carrot, but because of our values. So that's mm -hmm. step one. Your brand has to stand for something that right. is important. You believe in, and then everything else is a vessel to deliver those values. So we created a coloring book at one time. So we have all these, these carrot characters. There's like super carrot that has, it's Superman carrot. It's dolls. We've sent thousands of them out to our clients. Farmer carrot, um, coach carrot, carrot gal, carrot, the, you know, the carrot bud. Um, I think I'm missing one or two. And when people would hit milestones in their software, we would send out one of these in the mail. And they'd, of course, post it on social. You'll see, you'll see them up in the, on the shelves of people on the mm -hmm. back of videos and things like that. But we go, well, how can we... This is on accident, Steve. We found that they were giving those dolls to their kids or their animal a lot of the time, or they would put them back there to display. And they would send pictures of their kid on their first day of school with the super carrot. And like that was the thing that was protecting them on the way to school, that's going awesome. to second grade. And I'm going, dude, that's amazing. That's so cool. And I was going, how can we, and our customers would send that to us. I go, how can we connect deeper with, our, with the people and the things our customers care about? Their children, their, their animals, the causes they care about. And do it in, in a truly intentional way that we're doing it because we care about them, not because it's a tactic for marketing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we'd make more dolls. We made the, co the, the coloring books that had the char characters enacting a scene, and there was one scene for every one of our core values. And it, and it uh, was something where our customers could go through it with their kids, and they could impart on uh, our values in a way where mm -hmm. it's not like, word for word, but it's a person being positive and encouraging to somebody else. Yeah. One of our core values would be a beacon of positivity and possibility. Um, or one of our core values at that time was, was add humanity, show that you care. And so same thing. It's like someone going up to a, um, I think it was a, a carrot bud walking up to an old carrot gal house and giving her some flowers or something yeah. like that. But little things like that over time have been kind of cool. Or you, you see a, you see a customer who's on a fitness journey. I remember a guy out of, out of Tennessee, he was on a big fitness journey and he kept posting, kept posting, kept posting. And he posted something that said, man, I've been running so much. Uh, he was way overweight and he lost a lot of weight. Um, I'm almost done with these shoes. I go opportunity. Mm -hmm. Nike just came out with these killer shoes that I love that were like all orange and they were crazy comfortable. I hit up Jen, my assistant, send him out two pairs of those. Cause he's going to wear out one pair. I want him to wear it, put the second pair on too. Mm -hmm. So we sent out two pairs 
loves it, posts on social media, but now he's running out there. It's like he's powered by Carrot now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Carrot and our values. So that that's why we chose to spend to invest six hundred grand in that because it's way more than a color or a word or mm-hmm. removing. We spent three hundred dollars per letter mm-hmm. to remove. Three, we spent three hundred thousand dollars per letter to remove O N mm-hmm. from our domain name. Yeah, and it's worth millions. Well, and just to your point about the uh, anytime someone thinks of care, they think of you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so Adrian, yeah, Adrian Nez, like yeah. I got a chance to hang out with him for some time, mm. and we were in uh, it was Biloxi, I can't remember the name of the hotel. It's like a little mini Bellagio, yeah. And uh, I was like, dude, I'm buying you this carrot cake. There like, we you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't have a choice. And we posted <laughs> made stories yeah. about. It. I was like, yeah, you don't have a choice. Like, we're yeah. we're eating this carrot cake together, and we're sending this to Trevor. Like, yeah. we're we're posting this on Instagram, and we're tagging Trevor. Love it. I love it. I, and I, I remember that, and and that's happened so many times. And even with like close close more sales, mm-hmm. that's something I think about as I go. Love do- domain. That's a killer domain. And now, what's the mechanism that delivers that domain? Delivers the values through mm-hmm. other things. Um, with us, it happens to be colors and cutesy little things because there's like a carrot as a carrot, mm-hmm. but there's something there. Like yeah. there's something there that when people think about close more sales or think about sales disruptors, like it's this thing, uh, Tom Kroll, uh, it was the rhino or it was the bell. Right? It had nothing to do with wholesaling. Inc., no, but it had everything to do with his values and behind it, the okay, rhino and the bell. And we've seen other things like that with other companies too. So as soon as you find that thing, it just, you just keep injecting it into the conversation to get people, people to recognize something. Uh, as you, my favorite ones, Steve, are the ones that people see on a common basis. Like they're going to see the color orange every day. They're mm-hmm. probably going to f- see a carrot at least once a week. And I want them to see, see that all the time. Mm-hmm. So with Tom, I guarantee when people are watching, you know, National Geographic with their kids and a rhino <laughs> comes by and they're in wholesaling ink, they're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And they'll probably send a picture of it. Oh, for sure. Rhino and Tom Kroll. Yeah. You can't, you can't not make that connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so carrot, so we, we jumped in the domain, but you know, like why carrot, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like website design is an innovation, yeah. right? Like there's all sorts of different options. I mean, yeah. uh, you see right now they're making it so easy. Like when I was doing mm-hmm. it, right? Like I was using WordPress. Yeah. I, I did some HTML, but fortunately WordPress came along. Yep. Right. So now you got freaking like Wix and Squarespace mm-hmm. and go high level. Like everything. Yeah. It's, it's almost dummy proof. Yep. So yep. why carrot? Yeah. So at, at that time, so it would have been 2012 or so. I mean, it's today. Um, oh, like, today. Like, why should oh, I? I got you as, as a product. As a product. I got you. Why cool. should I use carrot? When yep. I, there's like, there's so many options here yep. that um, anyone that's mm-hmm. in college. Yep. You do it like not graduate college, like someone that's like yeah. freshman year college. You can make a website today, hundred percent. And and so the the original the original theory of carrot, and it still it still spans today. We've just amplified mm-hmm. it. Is even back in two thousand twelve, it was still easy to get online, mm-hmm. right? And so two thousand, let's say two thousand two through two thousand twelve, the call to arms for small businesses was get online, right? That's when you saw your Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, GoDaddy. All your local web developers popped up in that decade Mm -hmm. from 2002 or so through 2012. So everybody was online who wanted to be, or they could get online very quickly. Mm -hmm. The challenge that comes up is just getting online is not enough. Okay. It's actually performing and squeezing out those performance edges. Now for most companies, like if you're, if you're the corner um, convenience store in Roseburg, Oregon, conversion rate optimization doesn't really matter. Right. So go set that up with your $9 a month thing and you're just fine. When you're in a high margin service business, and that's that's what we identified when we when we came into this industry, high margin service business where if you lose a deal, it costs you ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty, fifty, a hundred, right? Yeah, losing a losing a, a Snicker bar sale doesn't hurt. No, it, it doesn't. So it, it it's a big one, and no one wants to to lose a, a fifty thousand dollar deal. Mm-hmm. So we walked back and said, can we make our sites and system perform in the three core areas better than anything else? to help you save lost deals that you don't even know you're losing right now. Um, and it's uh, speed is the first one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something every quarter we're, we're launching page speed updates. And even on the, even on the PPC side of things, we have landing pages. We're, re- we're revamping the landing page builder right now that are blazing fast where a lot of people will, will do Google pay-per-click tests. As they're sending them to their 2000 word homepage with all the pictures and videos. And of course that's going to load a little bit slower, but there's different pages for different, for different types of marketing. But PageSpeed is number one. 
Uh, number two is, is ranking ability. So I believe in evergreen marketing big time. That marketing you do one time, it builds momentum, and then it keeps working for you even mm -hmm. after you stop, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's getting ranked well in Google, yeah. right? Or offline version of that is networking. Mm -hmm. So that's the second one. We want to be the best in the world at helping you get an edge to rank better in Google for uh, the highest quality and highest converting leads. Um, by far, there's no other system, including custom WordPress sites uh, in our data that have more top five rankings and that have more seller leads coming through them other than Carrot. So mm -hmm. there's something there that's working. Right. There's some secret sauce there. There's some stuff that's not secret sauce. Mm -hmm. I was just banging on it for a decade, just refining right. and refining. Um, the third part of it is conversion rate optimization. This is probably the one that's the hardest to show apples to apples, mm -hmm. right? But it's also one of the ones that we've pioneered the most over the years. So when you look at um, sell my house, or when you look at like the call to action buttons, mm -hmm. the, the words in the buttons or the flow, most of those things emanated out of Carrot over the years. So what, what we focus on now is we're at any given time, we're running 10 to 20 split tests a month across a network of usually um, a couple dozen or even a couple hundred websites. So when we find things that convert quicker, we roll them out to the system so you don't have to worry about doing that yourself or we educate you on it. If it's something we can't just go change your mm -hmm. site. We don't want to change your logo or something like that. Um, and we're always rolling out page speed updates on the quarterly basis. We're always rolling out SEO uh, updates on the quarterly basis as well to make you guys stand out. So could you replicate um, a high-performing and high, highly optimized carrot site with a custom WordPress site? Of course you could, right? Of course you could. The, the, the question is, um, what are you going to have to invest to make that happen? Mm -hmm. Who are you going to have to have on your team? How much money are you going to have to spend now and over time to be able to make that true? We've had so many people. Tony Javier is a, a latest example, but so many big guys moving back over from custom sites. Gabriel, mm -hmm. Gabriel Garcia went carrot custom site, 10,000 hour custom site back to carrot the last mm -hmm. three years because performance. Right. So that, that's the main thing, Steve, is, is um, yes, your cousin Eddie can build a site. I can go launch a site on Wix. I can make it even look a lot like carrot. It's that one tweak, the five words, the placement of the, of the, of the button, the size of the button, the way it's displaying on mobile. If you miss that one thing, that could be that one lead that mm -hmm. was that $50,000 deal you lost. Yeah, and I think you look at, Here's something that I have. I always have to. It seems spend more time explaining than I mm. feel like I have to. But it seems yep. like that's always the case. Mm -hmm. Is like they'll look at a site and say, "But that doesn't look as good as this other site." Yeah. And oh man. So here, uh, why don't you speak on that? Oh, hundred percent, dude. I've, I've written blog posts on this. <laughs> you know, twelve hundred word bigger pockets replies. So I'll I'll start with this. Uh, what's the highest grossing and high, probably highest converting e-commerce site in the world? Amazon. Is it as pretty as apple.com? Not even close. No. Okay, so it, here, here, here's the thing. I'll go down to science now, mm -hmm. okay? So Amazon and Apple are, are probably among the top, you know, top three or four or five highest grossing retail sites mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Okay? Why do they look so different? If, if on one hand, Apple is sleek and lots of white space and big, big images in, in low text, and Amazon is not sleek and a million different small images and clutter, clutter here and there, why are they both looking completely different, yet also working? It's not that it it, it it's not that um, well it, it it's this they're going after different avatars, mm -hmm. right? Different avatars with different needs. The person who's buying an iPhone is looking for the sleekness. If they if they went to Amazon.com and Amazon.com as it is currently laid out was the thing displaying what an iPhone looks like, <laughs> you look at it and go that sucks. Like the branding of Apple is sleek and stuff. So the 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 design needs to match the avatar. The design needs to match what the avatar is looking for, and the design needs to remove resistance for that avatar. If I'm buying an iPhone once again or an iPad, I want to see the the fine design notes on the edge of that thing, which means it zooms in and makes. Tell it me cool. how many pixels per inch yeah. or whatever. Something. Whatever it is, right? <laughs> Over on Apple, it's a different avatar. It's or, quick, or on Amazon. Or on Amazon, it, yeah. it's it's quick purchases. That's your fingertips. It's being able to um, get anything you want. I'm not looking for fancy design, but anything I, I want with speed, with confidence. Okay? Mm -hmm. It has reviews, has different things to build, build confidence for that and help me discover it, different avatar. When we go in and look and talk about motivated sellers as an example, there's been, um, we've done a bunch of tests on it. We've done short copy, long copy, full white, beautiful Amazon looking or Apple, Apple looking pages versus the cluttered wordy pages that we have today. 
um, and marketingexperiments.com has ran many studies on long copy, short copy by industry. And what we found and marketingexperiments.com found, I, I linked up in some blog posts, is the higher risk the transaction is for the prospect, the more the person wants to be educated and the more copies needed to push them over the edge. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're doing a free report, you don't need to have very much copy, okay? Very little copy. A form, maybe a picture of what you're getting, a couple bullet points, and you're good. Very low risk. If you're looking at selling your house and getting an offer on it, it's a high-risk transaction. Mm-hmm. The two industries that MarketingExperiments.com found actually benefited from longer copy and converted better with longer copy than shorter copy, the only two were medical mm-hmm. and real estate. Medical and real estate. Every other industry actually got better performance with short copy. Interesting. So why is that? Big stakes things. When I'm looking to sell my house, I'm in distress. Oftentimes I need to do some research. I need to feel comfortable with the solution I'm finding. I need to even find out what options there are. Um, My dad uh, was diagnosed six weeks ago with a terminal brain cancer. Tough situation. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, I I appreciate it. It's, it's, It's been tough. Really, really tough. But what we've been doing is researching the heck out of stuff, right? right? And so before we go and make a move on any sort of treatment, I'm not going to do it off of a slim landing page. Dude, I'm reading 4,000 words on that thing, and I want to read yeah. every word of it. Yeah, right? every page. Every page. So the same is happening for a lot of sellers. Is we, We've tested squeeze page, landing page on paid traffic versus not. We've tested the heck out of that. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we haven't tested. We've tested dozens of times across hundreds of websites. And... What, what a lot of people talk about with, with the data is they say squeeze pages for PPC work better. Mm. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But what we've found on... That's a general principle. It's a general principle. Not necessarily real estate specific. Exactly. So here's where our data over decades... And believe me, we could make a switch and have all PPC traffic go to squeeze pages. The reason we don't is because the data shows us it shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a large scale of data. Now, Facebook ads should go to squeeze pages. We found that that in general, when you're driving from social media to a website, it should be to a squeeze page without a bunch of buttons to click and links to click because they're in distraction mode. They're not in research mode. You right. need to capture them while you got the attention. Mm-hmm. Okay? And, and especially getting crazy quick load times. Well, we were, we're interrupting them in the middle of something. Exactly. Versus the intentional of a Google search. It, it, exactly. So crazy quick load, load times are even more important on Facebook um, ads because uh, they're all mobile pretty much. And then you want it to be pretty slim content because they're mobile once again. Mm-hmm. So you go over to um, Google searches. A lot of those are desktop searches. Not all, but a lot of them are desktop searches. Person's in the mode of searching. And so when I, when I drive to a Google pay-per-click ad or an organic page, we actually found that you, you serve them up more information. You need to eliminate all objections that they have. Mm-hmm. Now, you still may get a little bit of a higher clicked conversion rate on a Google ad to a squeeze page. Where we found the real difference is, Steve, is lead to deal rate. And so when you track it all the way to deal, because we own investor fuse now, so we have the data all the way to deal now. Yeah. When you track it all the way to deal, and we took the leads that come in through all sources of, through investor fuse, mm-hmm. direct mail, all the other systems you can think of, and we know exactly what the lead to deal is. We know exactly what the profit per deal is mm-hmm. on all lead types that are coming in and even other systems. Mm-hmm. Okay, So we, we can come out with, with, with that data and show that lead to deal when done this way is is markedly higher. Yeah, yeah. That's so. It's fascinating the fact that you have between squeeze page and SEO and Facebook and this and that. Mm-hmm. But you know, just again for everyone that's watching, right? Like, could you mm-hmm. make your own page? One hundred percent. Yeah. Yes, you could. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what I did before mm-hmm. I was working with you guys. Yep. The amount of work necessary. Yeah. The amount of testing involved. Yep. Uh, plugins breaking for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. Or spam stuff. I mean, that, that's the latest one that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I was reading a Facebook thread the other day. And one of our clients like, man, we're getting hammered by spam. Everybody is mm-hmm. across the industry. And so our team man, um, measures and monitor those mm-hmm. trends. And then we have the aggregate so we can see the trends across everything. And we put spam blockers in mm-hmm. when that next wave comes in. So it's all those things. All right. Updating plugins, having the right plugins. You know how many people have came over to Carrot because they didn't update their whatever, whatever plugin for two years, it got hacked, mm-hmm. and they had to go to Upwork to pay someone 400 bucks to unhack it, mm-hmm. and then they're like, I don't want to mess with that anymore. Well, that was the other thing I was going to say was the Russian hackers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's stuff we, you know, we have a seven-figure payroll on the, on the tech tech side that takes care of that stuff for yeah. you. But So you could do this yourself, or... Totally could. You could just use a professional 
who's yeah. already testing it with 7,000 other clients. Yeah. Let's yeah, optimize the, it. The, the biggest objection that comes up, and this is a real objection, is all carrot sites look the same, mm -hmm. right? That's a, and it's, it's logical. Um, if you were to go, if you were to go look at like NASCAR, right? Um, NASCAR, the, the car that wins repeatedly or, or is, is winning more than others, it looks generally the same. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's certain tweaks and modifications. They made the drivers a little bit better. They honed this in, they honed that in, they really tweaked it and they're winning more consistently than someone else, even with a car that looks similar. And so the first thing I say is if something's winning, you should model the thing that's winning first, right? Don't go, that's winning. Let me go this direction mm -hmm. and do something completely different just for the sake of being different. So model what's winning first, and then you make it your own. And so you guys like Tony or Tom Caffarella, one of the biggest um, buyers in the country, or you can just go down the list, um, you know, Cody Hoffine and all those guys, they have carrot sites, but they've gone through and customized them. Mm -hmm. um, use the structure that performs great, our system of support and, and tech behind it, but then went through our concierge program or something else where you look at it and go, that doesn't look like a carrot site, but it's got the carrot elements there. Yeah. Yeah. So it still has the, the wireframe. Yep. Yep. Um, so you talked about this a moment ago, uh, but I, I was hoping you could um, spend some more time on it. So you're talking about energy audits because mm. you, you made some great content around energy audits. So I know we talked about it a moment ago, uh, but like, you know, for someone that, um, let's see, how, how can I elaborate this? For someone that is newer, mm -hmm. Right. As far as energy audits, what are some specific exercises they can do today to uh, to, to maximize their energy? And I know we mm -hmm. touched on it a little bit, but very, very specific instructions yep. for someone that's listening to the episode right now. Dude, so the, the first thing I, I would I would do, Steve, and same thing. I wish I would have done this years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, are you a disciplined guy? Like, do you are you naturally disciplined? I like to think so. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm absolutely not naturally disciplined. I, I have to try and do everything in my power mm -hmm. to try to stay disciplined. Um, all the way to the fact that I tried five gyms in five years, all five gyms in Roseburg, including the one across the street, and I wouldn't stay consistent. So yeah. then I built a gym in my office that I literally have to walk through the gym with my coach there at a certain time mm -hmm. to work out. Yeah. And now I have friends who work out with, us, with me in the gym, and it's amazing, mm -hmm. right? But that's how I have to build in these triggers for me. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the things that, that, that I would guide people to do very, very tactically is come up with your five non-negotiables, five daily non-negotiables, and, and make those five daily non-negotiables something that gives you energy, something that drives you forward that you're learning from, something that allows you to reach out and connect with people, okay? And I'll, I'll give you a few of mine. So I love reading, uh, but I don't have the discipline to do it oftentimes. I get distracted by Instagram or whatever. So um, one of my daily non-negotiables is to read 10 pages a day. I, I get energized when I read. I get all these ideas. I find mm -hmm. social media content potential, a bunch of stuff. Um, another one is sweat every day. I got that one from Dan Mart Martel, my coach, because he was just really leading the way with it. And he's like, every day he's working out. Mm -hmm. And I was going, man, I'm working out three days a week. That feels pretty good. And he called me out on it one day. And he goes, dude, but you're not working out more days a week than you are. I go, oh, <laughs> man, I am. Mm -hmm. When you count, count the weekends, right? You're actually, you're actually barely maintaining if you're mm -hmm. working out three days a week. And so I found when I move daily and work out daily, even if it's just a couple mile walk, I have more energy. Mm -hmm. So walk daily, move daily, take some of those calls and walk outside when you're on those calls. Um, take some of those meetings instead of Zoom meetings. They're walking meetings now mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, another one for me is a five, a five non-negotiable or a non-negotiable of reaching out to five people a day. It could be a text message, an Instagram DM. Mm -hmm. That gives me energy. If I can connect with people instead of being stuck in my little bubble over mm -hmm. here, the world gets bigger. Things are great. So come up with your version of five non-negotiables that you can do today with your current income. Yeah. And then ideally, those non-negotiables are probably going to be the same whether you have 10 million bucks in the bank account or 10 bucks in the bank account. Mm -hmm. I want to move every day, no matter how much money I have. I want to read every day. I want to be able to reach out to people every day. Um, and I've got a, a couple more that I'm like, I want to do those things every single day, every single day of my life, hopefully. So come up with those now, not for the future. You can do them now. Um, I think the other thing is recognizing when you do your best work. So this is very tactical. When do, you, when do you do your best work? For me, I do my best work before noon, mm -hmm. unless it's like this. So if it's like this, I'm doing all that afternoon. Mm -hmm. If it's me drawing and doing focus work, it's all before noon. So change your schedule if you're able to, to cater towards when you have the most energy to do the work that you love to do. Yeah. 
So just adjust that schedule and try as much as you can to, to hold fast to that. I don't take meetings before 11 o'clock, except for on Mondays now. Um, and so that's my time when I get to kind of do what I want to do. Um, yeah. You and I were talking offline. Yep. Uh, and you were talking about how you felt like you caught, you called it mostly right mm. between 2022 and 2023 yeah. with a shift. Mm -hmm. What do you do to stay on top of trends? It's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm going to say something that isn't very replicatable and it's probably not true. So we'll, 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 <laughs> let's go through and process this a little bit. I was going to say, I think I just have this kind of an innate ability to see trends, which I think might be true in some way, but there's got to be a way to replicate it. So um, for, for years, Steve, and, and I'll kind of tell you about why I think I, I called 80% of it and the part that I didn't is I, I do a pretty good job going macro, right? When, when a lot of people get stuck in the day-to-day -day or in, as Gary Vee would say, the, the dirt, mm -hmm. uh, being in the dirt on the day-to-day, hand-to-hand -day, you know, combat's great, but, but if you're in that too much, the world's moving around you, mm -hmm. right? And we don't know what's going on. So I, I, go, I go macro quite a bit. I'll have conversations like this. Um, I message our customers a lot. I'll say, hey, how's the market doing for you? Uh, what are the challenges you're having right now? Mm -hmm. um, I'm always reading and in, in, in learning up on ancillary products and ancillary industries. So I know that real estate invest, the investor world is this industry. Six, seven years ago, I'm, I'm reading up and diving deep in the retail market. Because I'm like, I think somehow these are going to converge together. How I got I that. So as well. Yeah, how I got that is, is, is history repeats itself, as they say. So I go, what other major industries... Uh, like what have the trends been over the last hundred years with major industries, with auto, with um, the the mortgage or not the mortgage, yeah, the mortgage industry, with uh, the stock industry? Look at all these industries and go, what happened to all those? They all went they all went through a phase where launch and everything, every everyone and their dog was selling cars or mm -hmm. making cars or doing newspapers or doing mortgages or whatever. Then it goes through a consolidation phase, mm -hmm. and then once the consolidation phase happens, the second technology catches up with the inefficiencies in that market, it, um, it makes more efficient the things that human beings are doing, yanks human beings out of it. It drives margins down, things mm -hmm. get squeezed. Do this happen in all of it? If you go look at the travel industry, the mortgage industry, the stock industry, mm -hmm. all of it. So I think being a student of trends outside of your industry is key because odds are history is gonna repeat itself. You just need to look and go, what other industries maybe had this, for us it's technology, right? What other industries had technology impacted sooner than real estate? Real estate took a while because it's a complicated transaction. Um, the stock, the stock market is a little bit simpler because they they can all route it through this. It's all in New York. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the real estate transaction is complicated. Mm -hmm. You've got the buyer with varying degrees of of, of knowledge and experience buying property. Um, you've got the seller with same thing, varying degrees of knowledge. You have the agent in there now. Mm -hmm. You have a title company or you have attorneys. Like it's just complicated. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's being a student of trends outside of your industry, going back 100 years, look at the major industries. How do they change? They all did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Blew up, consolidation, technology, add, add efficiency, removes the human element, makes it more efficient for the client at, at the end of the day, and then massive opportunity opens up after that. That's what happened. Massive opportunity for who? For, well, for, for the customer at the end of the day, because it should make things better for the customer. Mm -hmm. But let's go to the mortgage, or let's go to the, the, stock, the stock world, mm -hmm. okay? So back in the 80s, when the big crash happened in, in this, uh, the 1986 or 85 or whatever yeah. it is, stock crash, um, you had to call the stockbroker to make a trade at that time. And so what happened was this thing was crashing. Everyone's picking up the phone and calling. Um, and the, not getting through. Not getting through. They're, they're letting the phone ring because they're freaking out. They're going, I can't answer all those phone calls, nor am I wanting to. Everything's, it's, it's a nightmare. They're not able to sell. It then all of a sudden amplified the inefficiency. The customer got pissed off finally. Yeah. The customer said, this is no longer okay to have to go through a gateway or a toll gate in the middle between me and my stock. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when, when we look at it, that, where are their toll gates or gateways between the customer getting what they want and that toll gate taking money? Because eventually that toll gate's going to go away. Mm -hmm. So when we look at it from the mortgage side or the stock side or now the real estate side, there's a toll gate in there. And we're all looking at it going, I know a lot of people don't like that they had to pay that agent 35 grand to to do mm -hmm. a little bit of work. Right. It's an inefficiency. So the way the stock market did it, that, that happened. And then the regulations happened after that in mm -hmm. the industry to say, hey, stockbrokers, you can't do this thing anymore. At the same time, technology came in. 
Um, and I think it was Charles Schwab was among the first, if not the first, followed by E-Trade right after that. Now technology, along with the regulations, made it so they could um, add more efficiency and lower cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the customer wins. The customer wins to where it's a, it's a lower price. Now here's how the stockbroker won at the end of the day. The stockbroker who didn't shift lost their job or they went and became a call center employee at, at Charles Schwab, right? But the stockbroker or the, stock, the stockbroker who was able to shift and go, what can't be made more efficient with technology right now? It was, I'm going to shift to be a certified financial planner. All these de designations popped up the next 30 years. Oh, really? You saw CFPs. You saw all these de designations pop up over uh, the late 80s, mostly 90s, early 2000s, a gazillion of them. Okay, so the people with the same skill set said, well, that's no longer valid for me, or I'm just going to be okay with high volume, low, low, low commission, which some did that. But most of them either got out of business, became a call center employee at Charles Schwab, or they said, I'm going to go actually try to add value by being a consultant and delivering solutions that technology cannot provide. Yeah. They, they went out there and they became fiduciaries for the clients and an entire new industry really um, blossomed at that time. And, and there's a little bit of that with the travel industry. I wouldn't say it's as much, but a lot of travel agents went out of business. Mm -hmm. People are buying online. But now you have a lot of these specialty um, experience-based uh, travel opportunities that came up where they're going to craft and curate these crazy cool experiences. It's more than just going, I want to go to this place and do this cruise and get this hotel and the travel agent takes care of it or booking it on, on booking.com or whatever, or Expedia. It's now, I want something that, I want someone to craft a freaking cool experience. Yeah. And that industry isn't giant yet, but there's ones like that. Yeah. So I think the same thing is going to happen in real estate. I've been saying this for five years in the mm -hmm. podcast, Steve, where I'm like, uh, literally so many times in the podcast, I was calling this before all this happened. I'm going real estate agents. If you don't uh, embrace the hybrid approach, the retail market and the wholesale market are coming together. Um, I buyers accelerated it in the middle because mm -hmm. right? they became brokers, brokers too. And they're offering an offer and, and a listing that's accelerating the move towards the middle commissions are being compressed, right? Oh, yeah. That same thing that happened in all those other, other markets as commissions are compressed. Um, and they're being compressed by technology and competition. And all of a sudden you have people leaving the industry mm -hmm. because they can't make it on the commission or the ones who shift and they say, I'm going to be hybrid. I'm going to be a consultant to the seller rather than just taking an order of a listing right. or an offer. And then you look at that and go, okay, well, that's better for the seller. The seller gets a more direct way to sell their home. Might save a little bit of money maybe. But then we ask, well, what are the things that technology is not going to take care of? Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to flip out. It's not going to flip houses for, for us still. That's still going to be a thing for a long time. The more creative transactions... They're not going to happen through technology anytime no. soon. No, not at all. Um, it's going to be the bread and butter. The buyer's comfortable. They bought a house or two probably. Uh, they, they have the mortgage lined up, and it's that bread and butter home. Or it's a higher price home where the person just bought a bunch of them. They could give a crap about an agent representing yeah. them. But the complicated stuff isn't going away. So that's where I say people should double down on the complicated situations. Mm -hmm. They should double down on creative solutions, creative finance, sub two, all the things you guys know about. And, and become specialists in their area for those things. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, you and I have had long conversations about mm -hmm. is leadership. Yeah. So yeah. you have the how many employees at Carrot? 65, yeah. 65. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of humans. A yeah. A lot of emotions. Yeah. <laughs> how did you go from, let's make this website thing, to 65 employees? Yeah. Um. I remember, I remember pr pretty darn vividly in the early days when we had six, seven, eight employees and we were driving to a, our first ever company retreat. Like we did a, you know, we used to get everyone together twice a year at that time. Now it's once a year in person. And then once a year, you have the big virtual in the middle of the year. And so it was Pete, um, my, my head of sales at that time. He's like, hey, and Ad Adrian, I remember very vivid conversations with Adrian. He was at our very first company retreat in 2016 too. And and they were asking, like, how big do you think this is going to get? And I go, man, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to have more than, like, 12, maybe 18 employees. Like, I don't know if I can handle that. And so the, the, the challenge I think that we have to go through, Steve, is it goes back to vision. Number one, is my vision big enough that it's going to require me to learn how to be a better leader? At that time, it didn't. I was just trying to get to a million a year. And I'm like, cool, mailbox money, and let's sit back and let's do whatever we're going to do. But as I saw the impact we were making for our clients, and as I saw the impact we we're making for our community there in Roseburg, Oregon, being able to take profits and put them into buying buildings and building entrepreneur group and entrepreneur co-workspace and, 
and other things and really solidifying our company mission to help people build businesses of freedom and impact. I go, man, who am I? If that's what I'm truly passionate about, who am I to say there's all these other people out there in the world that don't deserve that because I'm scared to become a better leader? That's a good question. And I just, I was thinking about it. I'm like, well, what if I just want to have a pile of money and just go relax and whatever? And I'd have to ask those questions. Well, would I truly be happy about that for, happy with that for a long time? And the answer for me kept going back to, no, I, I don't, I, I always want to be doing interesting work. I want to be doing work that's valuable to people. And as I kept asking that question, I say, well, if I'm not going to grow with carrot then, and I still want those things, and let's say I sell carrot or just hit pause on it so it doesn't grow, I'm probably going to need to go find that same feeling somewhere else. So I'm going to start another company. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to continually be stuck at this, at this level. I'm going to be continually, continually stuck at $1 million a year, or whatever that number is, and I can never grow past it because I will never step into that grow, that pain line and say, how do I need to grow as a leader? What do I need to learn? Who do I need to get around me? So that pain line is now something I just know. And so I just internalized that and recognized that there are those lines. And I just said, man, I remember a, a buddy of mine ran his first marathon. Mm -hmm. And um, he got done at the marathon. I haven't ran a marathon yet. I'm, I'm going to do it this next year. But um, he got done at the marathon. I asked him how it was. He goes, dude, I get mile 18. Dude, it, it, it just hit me. I mm -hmm. uh, hit, hit this massive wall. And then I said, what did you do? And he goes, man, well, I pushed through it and it took me a couple miles, but then I got my second win. And then he said it hit him again at like mile 20, 24 or something like that. And so he said the thing that got him through that um, was the fact that he knew it was coming. He knew that that pain or that pain line and running, that mm -hmm. pain was going to come somewhere around mile 16 to 20 and probably again because people told him that. Yeah. Right? And so when he hit that pain, he knew it was coming so he could go, I know it's going to go away too because the guys said it would. Mm -hmm. If I just push through it and I, and I, you know, and I adjust my mindset and adjust my gait or whatever I need to do, I pop a little gooey thing or whatever, mm -hmm. get energy, I'm going to make it through that. And I look at business the same way. When you're running the marathon of business and you don't know where those pain lines are and you're running blind, <laughs> did you hit the pain lines? It feels like pain that you don't want to go through. Yeah, the world's falling apart. Yeah, if you hit the pain line and running a marathon, let's say no one ever told you you're going to hit that or how to get through it, a lot of people are probably going to give up. You stop. They're just going to go, dude, I think my leg's going to fall off. I'm probably, like, I'm probably burning a hole in my, my gut right now. It's a health issue. But in business, that's why I say things break at threes and tens, right? Things break at 100,000, 300,000, a million, 3 million, 10 million, 30, and, and above. And at every, at every spot during that, I've got an entire matrix. Like, it's insanely detailed. Every single level, all the way in the identity you need, you need to adopt, um, how leadership changes, mm -hmm. how your team changes, how your marketing changes, how your strategy changes in this industry, all the way up to 10 million. Um, insanely detailed. And as long as you know that that pain line's coming, then you know you can plan towards it. Mm -hmm. You know what you need, what you need to grow in, um, what you need to learn, who you need to get around you. So that, for me, is how I got over that. I had the vision going, mm -hmm. I don't want to leave all these people in the world hanging if this is what I truly believe. If, if, this, if this mission is actually what I believe, not just a thing on paper, then I should reach as many people as possible with it. Yeah. Then number two, how do I now not kill myself in the process? And it's knowing the pain lines so you know that they're going to go away, but also using this business as um, business is the best personal growth tool I've ever, I've ever encountered. Oh, definitely. And so that's the, that, that was that big challenge for me at the million-dollar mark when I was getting ready to hit pause in the business and go, I'm, I'm good. I asked those questions and I said, okay, um, what am I going to have to do now and who do I need to surround myself with? Uh, who do I need to learn from to uh, remove these limiting beliefs that more employees equals more pain? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't. Um, I would say my business today was 65 employees and my job is far easier than it was when I had 15. Yeah. But you have pain lines and employees too, 20, 25 employees. 20, between 20 and 30 is hard. Well, that's good because I'm at 19, so... Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. And the reason for that, uh, Steve, is because that's usually the spot where you might have a manager or two mm -hmm. if you're between 10 and 20. That, like, you have this manager who manages two or three other people that kind of do the same thing, right? But once you get up, upwards of 20, 25, 30, depending on the business, you usually have to have, like, your first director, your head of, right? And that's usually also where you're probably around that 3 to 10 million. Three to ten million, you get your first head of or your first director. 
And the difference with a director versus a manager, a manager manages the day-to-day -day delivery of the thing that's already been decided, right? This Here's this plan. Here's the motion. You just make sure that that happens every day. The director works with you as the executive or the strategic person to make the plan. They have buy-in on it, so you should be working on it together, but it's still your plan. They just they they are collaborative mm -hmm. in it, but they own the result. So they're fully on the hook for making sure that plan gets executed and the result happens. Mm -hmm. That's way that was way harder for me to lead a director than a manager. Yeah. Well, it's a much higher level executive. Yeah, and, and you ha you have to you have to lead completely different. If you lead an individual contributor versus a manager versus a director versus a C level, completely different. Mm -hmm. Like when we hired our COO, I hit up Dan. I'm like, dude, I've never hired a real C level person, like an actual legit C level. Like a person. Fortune 500 C level person. Yeah, I mean, per, a person who who deserves the title, right? Yeah. Um, most C COOs in, in the real estate industry are not COOs; they're operations managers at best. Um, but they have the inflated title and the inflated pay. And so, the 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 legit COO. I was getting ready to make the full onboarding like we normally would, like this this. 60 day onboarding or whatever it was and all these details go check out this and do this and learn mm -hmm. this and i'm looking at it and my my head of people built it all out based off of how we hired other people i'm looking at it going, man it just doesn't seem like our coo would have to go through all that stuff so i hit up dan and go dan how do you onboard like a coo or c level um i said you know do you make a 90-day plan for them or whatever and he goes he goes no he goes they make the 90-day plan mm -hmm. Because you just give them the goals, and they need to come back to you with a plan. You don't onboard them; they onboard themselves. And so you you ask them, "Here's where we're going." You onboard them into the systems, mm -hmm. make sure they're familiar with other things. But like they are the ones who are supposed to tell you what to do, Trevor. You're not supposed to tell them what to do for 90 days. That's way different than an individual contributor, or a manager, or even a director. Yeah, yeah. Well, that gives me some clarity. All right. Yeah, dude. I'll I'll share the 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 deal with you that literally walks through it in detail what pain line you're probably in at your phase yeah how you get out of it who you probably need to hire mm -hmm. it's it's fun once well, you have that you asked me about a post right mm -hmm. that i made is like you know like everything okay and it's like yeah well i'm learning these lessons yep right and yep. And, and here's the single most painful part for me mm -hmm. in all of this the reason why it hurts me so much is that i'm on a michigan 100 millionaires yeah i've said this over again mm -hmm. and part of that is lifting everyone that's around me especially the people yeah. that work in my organization. Mm. Letting someone go is consciously being aware yeah. that this person is not going to be mm. one of the millionaires. I'm going to be. Gotcha. That's a hard decision too. Right? Like I am yeah. like, I, you cannot like, and right. The person that got me here won't get you there. Yep. Right. Yep. And loyalty is so important to me. Yep. Right. So like mm -hmm. have a person that works with you that wants to, that has, Raise their hand and says, yes, I want to be part of this journey. Yep. And say, I'm yeah. sorry you don't get to be on this ride with us. Yeah. That's it, hard for me. It's hard, man. And I'm, I, I love people, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I had to pull myself out of the hiring process until, mm -hmm. like, the very end is because I love everybody. Like, every, yeah. every candidate looks great to me unless they're terrible, right? <laughs> which, which, in general, you know, then I have paralysis at the end of the hiring decision. So mm -hmm. we have a great hiring process now. But... um. I found that it's that for me the hardest was that three to ten million mm -hmm. because at that stage is where it really shines a light on those who are not able to grow in the leadership side of things. Your individual contributors who are fine being there, mm -hmm. they can still be fine as long as they're okay with the change of the culture. All right. Um, and and that's what was a challenge for some of our team members early on that are still individual contributors and were early on too, as you would hear these little grumblings of it's like, oh, the good old days, or mm -hmm. well, man, we can't do that anymore. Um, which is true, and some of it you kind of you know long for those days a little bit, but it's it's a trade off. Mm -hmm. But the three to ten is where you had this person who was an individual contributor, they became a manager, and and you go, I need to have a director for this or a head of or whatever you want to call them for this department for marketing or for sales or for product or whatever. And the logical thing is to give that guy or gal a chance, right? Mm -hmm. Who's in the department and they're kind of positioned for it. And and I did that a lot, and. Some worked, some didn't. The, the problem, when you love people so much, like you and I do, and you believe in them, as I go, maybe it's next quarter. Like, may, maybe next quarter they're going to unlock. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to make a better plan this time. And then you do, and there's some justification on why they didn't perform. Then I'll go, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't coaching them good. It's my fault. Because mm -hmm. they're a good person. And then some of the things they're saying, like, it sounds like I didn't set them up for success. All of a sudden, you're a year or two into this thing. Mm -hmm. And now you have shrapnel on the people who work for them. 
um, it's hard. Uh, I I let go of my uncle who's worked with for us for five years in July. It was hard. Yeah. Him and two other amazing people I love. Like, I love these people. Um, they didn't have a spot anymore at the company. Uh, he wasn't able to grow mm-hmm. into what we needed for that le- that next phase. It was creating um, some real challenges around yeah. the company. It's, it's really painful, right? It's hard. Like it's, uh, mm-hmm. What the company needs right now, that vision, what the company needs right mm-hmm. now, there's not a spot for you for yeah. what the company needs. Mm-hmm. And logically, that makes sense. Yeah. If I'm coaching someone, they're like, hey, I have this problem. Oh, it's easy. Go do A, B, and C. Yeah. It's easy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. pulling the trigger and actually make, and, and, and doing hard. it, like looking at someone, because I still, I'm, I'm doing it, right? Like, mm-hmm. like looking you in the eyes, like, hey, look, yeah. this isn't it. Like, this isn't working. Like, it's still yeah. hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- those combos are hard. A, a couple of things I have learned that um, if for anyone who has employees or who um, is in that situation possibly, is there are right and wrong ways to do it. Yeah. Um, I don't believe in pips. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've tried pips, performance improvement plans. Mm-hmm. It's like the second you make a pip, you already decided that they're not a right fit, mm-hmm. and you're just prolonging the challenge. What, what I've found usually is, is a performance improvement plan tends to be you delaying the decision because you think that you're going to get more information and more context, or you think that they're going to rise to the occasion when you put a deadline on them, mm-hmm. right? And it's like that's never, I've never one time had a pip work. And we've probably put a dozen or, or more people onto a true pip. Um, and, and it also is usually like, well, I, I want to add that last little layer of just justification on why mm-hmm. I let them go. So in, instead, and it's hard, right, because it takes more intentional uh, thought on it. But instead, of what if, what if we're really clear that they own these numbers? Like, they, what does ownership truly look like? And making sure that you, you're all really clear on, on what we call the racy, who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted, and who's informed. Are they truly accountable to that metric? If they are, let them be accountable to it. Mm-hmm. And don't take it, that away from them. That's where I'm bad. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll see someone struggling with them. I'm like, dude, I can help you out. Yeah. I'll dive in and help them out. And now the number works, or I didn't. You can't let them go because they didn't succeed or fail with it. Mm-hmm. So we dive in as entrepreneurs who want to help our team and want to help them win. And we mess them up by either helping that effort win or mm-hmm. helping it lose. But now you can't. They weren't accountable to that now. Yeah. And so making them truly accountable to it, giving them a chance to truly rise that occasion and step into that um, or not, and, and setting really clear timelines. Hey, by this date, you know, can, can we all agree that if we don't hit these, these, these goals or whatever it is by this date, it's not going to be a fit, like saying that up front. Mm-hmm. And even when you hire the person, here's your 90-day plan. Can we all agree that if, if we don't feel like, you're here by this time. That's probably just not a fit. Let's part ways at, you know, before the 90 days. Mm-hmm. Have that conversation early. Yeah. 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 And again, for everyone, like, like it's, this is a, a ticket repetition. Yeah. It's hard. Right. I'm still not great at it. That's why yeah. I've got a COO who's great at that stuff. And I'm not. Yeah. And I, I role played this like a whole bunch of times. Oh, man. For having the conversations. Because I want to make sure I do it the right way. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I role played the one where we laid my uncle off. And of course, nothing that I role played, I said. No, it doesn't because work out that the way. the emotions go in there, and yeah. I'm like, oh, man, this sucks. But, yeah, it's yeah. hard. So, I mean, you got a lot going on, right? So you got um, sales message. You got Carrot, uh, Investor Fuse mm-hmm. now. You got a lot of things going on. Yep. What is your why? Yeah, my, my why, man, goes, goes back to that company mission. Uh, when, when I considered selling Carrot a few years ago when I got a, got a big offer from a PE firm, mm-hmm. I asked the question, like, why would I take that, that, why would I take that number, that, a big number? And would it be life-changing? Yeah, it, it, it would be um, to a degree. I mean, I, I'm fine money-wise right now. Would it really change my lifestyle? Not really. I might fly private a couple times a year, but other than that, mm-hmm. I'm not a fancy car guy. I want a 63 split window vet. Like, that's pretty mm-hmm. much my thing. But so it wouldn't change my lifestyle a lot. So when I looked at it, so well, why would I consider selling? It's either you don't believe in your mission mm-hmm. anymore. Or you think that the market's shifting, it's timing, you need to, you need to capture the opportunity there. And I looked at that mission, I go, man, if I sell a company, I'm still taking that mission with me. Mm-hmm. It's to help people build businesses of freedom and impact. And we've even, even expanded it to help people live lives of freedom and impact. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's because, Steve, I built two businesses that trapped me. I built two businesses that made some money and they trapped me. I wanted out of them. I was miserable. Um, I wouldn't have used the word depressed at that time, but I probably was. I was moping around, getting out of the house maybe once every 
once or twice a week says working mm-hmm. in my home. Um, I was the guy who everyone would look from the outside in and go, man, he, he's kind of got it made, which I did. I wasn't grateful about mm-hmm. it. Um, but, dude, I want to prevent that from happening to more entrepreneurs because I know when people are able to build businesses that they enjoy more often than not, that make good money, enough money where they can cover all their wants and needs and enough to make an impact outside, the world changes. Yeah. Um, and that's it, man. I want to help people build a business of freedom, which is a business that allows them to have time to do what they want to do and a business that creates impact, which then once again takes that time and the mm-hmm. money to go truly change something in the world. Yeah. yeah. I don't think the government's going to solve our problems. It's got to be guys like you and I creating, uh, you know, hundred millionaires yeah. to go out there and then go do something with that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the reason why we talk about, you know, the, the gospel of capitalism and entrepreneurship yeah. is because mm-hmm. uh, if everyone, not everyone, but a good healthy percentage of the population, whether it's 2%, 10%, whatever, mm. knows how to make money, yeah. the rest of society benefits, right? Yeah. The velocity of the money, the way it goes, if I buy carrot mm-hmm. and then someone at carrot and employee at carrot can go buy this yep. and that like that is never talked about as far as how like when the money yeah. travels everyone wins that's mm-hmm. national gdp we measure the national gdp but we don't i don't think school teachers or anywhere else really talk about like how when money moves mm-hmm. everything's good it's when money stops yeah that bad things happen like yeah you know we're kind of feeling that a little bit mm-hmm. right now so Huge. yeah Huge. so i think the the ability to teach people how to make money yep it, it helps everyone. Oh, big time. And yeah. with, within that too, you know, this is probably three years ago, I was taking it a level deeper and like, uh, if, if I were to really go for my why, you know, I, lo- I know a lot of people say family and mm-hmm. you know, I absolutely love my family to death and they are a why, right? Uh, Dan, Dan Martell talks about your big bag of whys. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got that from the Iron Cowboy, a guy who did 100 uh, Iron Man in 100 days. Mm-hmm. Or no, yeah, 100 Iron Man in 100 days. And he said, the only way you can do that is by having not just one why, but a big bag of whys. Mm-hmm. Because the second that why doesn't work for you to push you through that hard thing, mm-hmm. you got to have another one and another one and another one and another one. So that's my professional why. You know, family obviously is in there. And I want to make my kids proud and my, my, my wife proud and provide for them and want to be a great example for my, my daughters and my son who wants to be an entrepreneur. He, mm-hmm. He's a sheep farmer right now. He has sheep and he sells them and stuff. He's <laughs> 11 years old. And, um, but the, the other part of it, dude, is I truly want to contribute. And... When I thought about it, like, wh- when do I feel? When do I feel the best? Um, it's when I'm not chasing significance of myself, but I'm chasing service. And it's when I'm creating and connecting. Dude, when I'm creating something and I'm connecting with people, mm-hmm. I'm loving life. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely. helping people, um, and I'm helping to serve. The second I pull it back to me, and it's about significance and building my greatness, is the second the weight comes on you the heaviness comes mm-hmm. on you and um that's where most people's why tends to, to focus in on become financially free or whatever those are all good things but um that's all you and your significance that's a heavy burden to uh to, to pull Definitely. put it back on other people and serve what's your biggest struggle right now biggest struggle right now honestly is um on, on the business side is learning how to lead um executives well and not messing things up every day, every single day. Like I had, <laughs> had, a, had a meeting yesterday with my COO and she's amazing and nice and a very, uh, she's exactly what the company needs and love her to death. And she came to me with a challenge that I created and very nicely walked me through how I created that challenge. And I'm like baffled in my mind how I did it again. Cause I'm like, I know not to do that, but I did, but I did it to try to help my team. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's me getting out of, my own way and get out of the company's way and the mm. things that I do best. That's yeah. the hard part. The things you do best, getting out of the, the way is hard. Yeah. And so that's the hardest thing right now. I got me. a I got a nice Slack or Google chat message. I want to say about six months ago, maybe nine months ago. Mm. And it was me. It was like, oh, we're going to do this. Right. Yep. And I, I had this idea. So I went to Textiful, made the keyword, put in the yeah. podcast and this and that, and then created all this automation. Right. Because I know I still know how to do these things. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I don't think about we have a different process now. Mm. So making this yep. change over here breaks this thing over here. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. Because our process have changed. Mm-hmm. And so I got a nice message. Mm. Like, if you could just please get out of our way. <laughs> Dude, 100%. 100%. And the, the thing with that, Steve, that, that's the piggyback, that's a learning lesson, is um, I need to get a couple things strategically ahead 
of my team. So they're not, so, so they're not moving on things that are misalignment from up here mm -hmm. strategically. And then they go do it. And I'm like, ah, ah, shoot, but that's not where we're going. Mm -hmm. And I've created that um, shrapnel a, a number of times the last six months. Mm -hmm. But then the real challenge is now how do you get your team ahead of you? Mm -hmm. How do you get your team ahead of you? So the vision is clear enough. The strategy is clear enough. The principles are there so they can make decisions. I have to come back or wonder if Trevor's going to, flip that decision later because I've done that sometimes yeah. <laughs> and on in, inadvertently. Yeah. How do I now get them ahead of me with the clarity, just sitting down, getting clear, clear, mm -hmm. clear on vision and strategy. For so where they're doing things before you think of it. Yeah. And, and making sure that it's heading in the right direction this time because yeah. they're still doing things that before I think of it right now, it's kind of just making sure it's going in the right direction, mm -hmm. which is on me. It's not on them. They're doing right. their best with um, gaps in direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely my biggest struggle today. Oh man, it's hard. Yeah. As soon as I master, I'll let you know. <laughs> and I'll I'll teach you what I learned. What is your superpower? Oh man, superpower. Um, I'm gonna say one of my dad's superpowers is mine too. Um, being a, a beacon of positivity and possibility. Mm -hmm. It's our first core value. Um, it's the thing that I probably learned the most from my dad, even even during his stage four terminal cancer this last six weeks. Um, he walks into the cancer center yesterday. I, I checked him in to get his radiation. He has his cane, which he's needed sometimes because it's he started to have a left side deficit from the brain tumor, just mm -hmm. even from healthy to, to walking with the cane in six weeks. And he walks in. He's got a pep in his step. He sees the guy he's been seeing in there every day, picks up his cane. He's pointing at him. He's carrying his cane, twirling around. He's swinging the cane like a baseball bat in there. He's joking with people. He talks to the guy. He goes, you look, you look better and better every single day, Mark. It's like in the second he's got a terminal illness going in to get his brain zapped from radiation, he's uplifting that guy sitting right there that's going through the same situation. Yeah. So that's that's where it's at. Yeah, it's that. What is uh what's been the biggest regret in your career? Um hmm. probably that I, I didn't I didn't focus on building the people around me more intentionally sooner. Mm -hmm. Um I focus on my personal growth which is important all, all the way up to a million, especially, but once you really get closer to 3 million and above, it's actually about building them. Mm -hmm. And I kept it about what do I need to do to do to grow and assumed everyone else is building themselves. Yeah. So it's, you know, as Dan would say, build the people so that people can build the business. One of the best investments I made was um, the very first time I hired a coach for the entire you know leadership team. Mm. We hired Larry Yatch, a uh, former, oh, cool. former Navy SEAL. Yeah. And man, the the accountability and communication within an organization mm. rised dramatically. I bet. I bet. Right? Like um, the sun was shining on everything. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere <laughs> left to hide. Could not hide anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? But man, like that was just one investment. Mm. And I look back, like that's probably one of the best investments I made. Yep. Because <laughs> uh, I saw Eric Brewer made this uh, post, right? Everyone says they love their culture. Mm. Until accountability kicks in. Yep. Right. Yep. Exactly. Or like they say, yep. like my like, what's the, your number one strength? Culture. What's your number mm -hmm. one challenge? Accountability. Yep. It's dude. We're we're the same. So we that, that was one of the things our COO brought in is we're looking at our core values mid year, and she goes, "There's just something missing here," and we all knew what it was. That there was no, there was nothing around accountability and yeah. like actually getting stuff done. It was like positivity and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, create amazing products, craft amazing experiences. Which is all great. Like we believe in all that, mm -hmm. but there's that one part missing, which is a really important part, mm -hmm. and that's what we got wrong for a few years. Yeah. yeah, I mean, really, it wasn't until this year we've always talked about accountability. Mm -hmm. We've always uh, like it's, it's it's been discussed, but this is the first year where we said like, if you can't hit this, yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. You just can't be here. Yep. And this is the first year we've done it. Before we were doing, it's like, all right, how can I help you? We need more coaching yeah. with this or that, and it's, mm -hmm. and it's worked for a long time. It yep. got us here. Mm -hmm. Yep. But we're not going to get where we want to go. Yeah. If we're going to keep letting people slip accountability, mm -hmm. and and it does work when you have a smaller staff, right? Because mm -hmm. you can directly coach three, four, five, six, seven people. Yeah. Once you get where you are now, um, it requires someone else who's able to coach them all, or mm -hmm. you've got to elevate the person. Right. Um, and it's hard. So yeah, you, it, it's natural to, to, to have lower accountability or not the official things 
you know, in the early days because you can work with them directly yeah. to help fix it. Yeah, if I hear you say something on the call, right, real quick, yep. hey, say this. Yep, exactly. Right? Real fast. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and you're not having to look at the metrics as deeply because you're listening to it and you can, you can coach yeah. it. But yeah, we're in the same room. When you're not, then it's all about here's the goals, here's the outcomes we set, yeah. how are we doing towards that, here's our goals versus the outcomes, what yeah. are you doing to get it back on track, and yeah. Yeah, fun stuff. Oh, man. Uh, what is the uh, single greatest lesson you've learned along the way? Um, I'll, I'll go back to go back to the energy uh, part mm-hmm. of it. That I, I think my my life, personal life and business life changed when I flipped from optimizing for productivity and money to energy. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see when I'm older, 60, 70, 80 years old, I'm not gonna be thinking about optimizing for productivity or money. It's like I want to get energy so I can live mm-hmm. um, and not just you know, survive. So yep, shifting from en- from, uh, to energy. Gotcha. So I want you to think about uh, some last thoughts uh, you want to leave the listeners with. Mm. Um, guys, I hope you guys got a ton of value. We talked about a whole bunch of different things, right? Like we're talking about marketing, leadership, entrepreneurship, failures. Yeah, right? took you guys on a journey. Yeah, we talked about a lot of different things. So guys, if this was valuable for you guys today, please hit that subscribe button. Give us a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, and so on, because the more people we reach the more people we can help going back to if we can show everyone else how to make more money along the way yep it helps everybody oh man yep yeah 100 right? so please help us if you guys get value today uh last thoughts you'd like to leave everybody with mm. dude i i think i think the biggest thing i'll, I'll kind of give three little things here uh number one know the path right mm-hmm. once you have identified that there's a path with the things breaking at threes and tens and the pain lines then you know what you're going to be going up against. You know to recognize that pain or those trials as a growth opportunity, not as an opportunity to run away. Yeah. Okay, so know the path. Um, second part, I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. Uh, James one it, uh, in, in the Bible, I research, I, I memorized that whole thing two years ago, and I love it so much because it's got this one part in it where it says, "Count all trials as joy, my brothers," and then it talks about uh, the trials are going to make you steadfast. The trials are going to make you stronger. And make it, make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So shift every pain point you're having right now, y'all. The challenge with the the employees, or um, that you know, you can't get the deals done, or whatever it is to go. Okay, I just haven't learned something, and this is this is God like putting this thing on me that I need to learn something here. So what what am I going to learn? This is done for me, not to me. So shifting the way you're framing things, and I think the third thing, man, is like the more that we can step in and uplift people around us. I'll go back to being a beacon of positivity and possibility. If you can uplift people around you, no matter what business you're doing, you're going to have people who want to work for you, Mm -hmm. who want to follow you, who want to be customers of yours, um, who look up to you. And just really, guys, focus on being of service to other people, uplifting and encouraging as much as you possibly can. And I can guarantee your life is going to be way better than always trying to get yours and uh, you beat that person or keeping up with the Jones. Just like, Mm -hmm. nope. How do I serve that person? Right. Yeah. Just give. Yep. And that goes back to one of my stories at the very beginning. The first paid client I ever got was I, I said, I'm going to stop get, trying to get mine. I'm just going to give to them. Right. And then they offered me money after that. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. How can someone get a hold of you? Yeah, pro- probably best is, is Instagram um, or my website. So IG is just Trevor.mock. That's M-A-U-C-H. Um, I answer all my all my DMs over there, so follow me over there. Be pumped to see you guys over there. Uh, and then my podcast, so the mm-hmm. Carrot Cast, so CarrotCast.com. Um, every Thursday is the episode I do, mm-hmm. um, and Tuesday Brady on my team runs those. But every Thursday, it's on my cell phone here. I'm driving home, and I call it the Truck Talks, <laughs> and it's just this conversation right here. It's like literally what's going on in my mind in my in my world right then, and how can the audience learn from that. Yeah. It's all these entrepreneurship lessons, mindset lessons, uh, things like that. So Carrot Cast, uh, if you guys like this entrepreneurship talk. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Appreciate, Appreciate you, you man. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, you guys Thank watching. You. See you guys later. Shout Thank y'all. Steve train. Jump on the Steve train. We real estate disruptors.